Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks for joining me for this special extra long episode that will keep you company throughout the night. We've stitched together ten of our favorite spring-themed stories, all of which I've read. So simply settle in and relax, ready to enjoy the beauty of spring while you drift off to sleep, so you can wake up tomorrow feeling as fresh and renewed as the season itself. The birds are chirping and calling out to one another. The smell of pine and herbs travels through the open windows in the living room. It's one of the warmest days so far this season, and Sarah is tingling with excitement for what's to come. The temperature outside was perfect this morning, so the first thing Sarah did today was open the large windows to let in the fresh air and bright spring sun. She adores spring. It's not her favorite season, but she admires its craft, the way the earth wakes up from its hibernation and slowly comes back to life bursting into full, vivid color after the gray of winter. It's like when color came to motion pictures. A once black and white world has turned into a vibrant one. Sarah is currently tidying up the living room. She laughs to herself at the thought of spring cleaning. Perhaps seeing the bright sun kiss the grass again motivates everyone and sends them straight to the broom closet, she thinks. It does feel magical to have the sheer white curtains open and the beaming sun casting light on the wooden floor. That's why Sarah is happily twirling around the house as she sweeps. Her broom sends up specks of dust that sparkle in the rays of light streaming through the glass. As she often does, Sarah is listening to one of her favorite albums on her record player. The song that's playing now is a bright and cheerful tune, perfect for Sarah's current mood. She has spent most of the morning dancing, cleaning, and singing into her broomstick, and has tidied up every room. Now, she's almost finished and she scoots the last of the winter's dust into the dustpan. Then, she walks down the hallway towards the kitchen, carrying the broom and dustpan, careful not to tip it over. A colorful bouquet of light paints the hallway, thanks to the stained glass with a mosaic pattern on her front door. Sarah tiptoes through the reflected colors until she is at the end of the hall, facing the kitchen. She walks over to the bin 
and empties the dust into it. Then she heads to the opposite corner to put the cleaning supplies away. She turns the metal doorknob of her broom closet. It feels cold to the touch as she pulls the door open. Sarah then places the broom and dustpan back into their cozy spaces, tucked away from the light. When she's done, the door clicks shut. She retraces her steps back to the living room and is greeted once again by the smell and beauty of spring in the mountain cabin. The curtains are fluttering as the fresh breeze blows through the open windows. It looks beautiful, Sarah thinks. She stands in front of the glass, holding her arms out to her sides, and slowly breathes in deeply through her nose. Then she closes her eyes and lets the feeling of the gentle wind caress her. Why stay inside on such a bright and warm spring day? Sarah thinks to herself. Her mind made up, she turns around and makes her way back to the hall. The mosaic is still casting a variety of colors on the wooden floorboards. Sarah smiles, appreciating the quiet beauty of this moment. She keeps her shoes by the door, careful not to drag in too much dirt from the outside world. Above the shoe corner is a tall, dark coat rack, draped in winter jackets and scarves, with a selection of hats on top. She rustles through the knitted winter caps until she reaches her straw bucket hat. There's a pleasant feeling in her chest at the thought of getting to wear it again. Honestly, she can't remember the last time it was warm enough to put it on. Sarah feels the straw's rough texture in her hand as she holds the wide brim hat in front of her. She slips it over her shiny hair, and the hat crackles as it settles into place. Sarah contemplates what to put on her feet. She's torn between sandals and her comfy gardening shoes. After a moment of contemplation, she slips on her socks and shoes, knowing all too well that she'll want to get started on her garden the minute she steps outside. All ready to go, Sarah reaches for the metal doorknob. Despite the warmth of the day, The metal here also feels cold to the touch. It sends a pleasant little shiver down Sarah's spine. But all is forgotten when she opens the door and is quickly embraced by the warm sun and aroma of early spring. Sarah steps out onto the big wooden porch that wraps around the house. It's dotted with plants and outdoor furniture. A bird feeder hangs on the side closest to her living room window. Birds gather there 
in the mornings and afternoons for a tasty snack and a chat, almost like people visiting their favorite coffee shop. Sarah takes a moment to admire her spectacular view. She is certain she has one of the very best views around. The rugged mountains reach up to the cloudless blue sky in the distance. Sarah has always thought they have an almost magical energy about them. As she scans the landscape, she can see layers of forest green pine trees that slowly fade into a windswept meadow where wildflowers grow. They tend to blossom a bit later in the season. But it was a wet winter, and Sarah knows that helps the soil and the plants to thrive once the snow melts away. Closer to her cabin, there is a small fire pit with carefully placed wooden logs. She enjoyed evenings there with friends during the winter, at least those who were brave enough to embrace the cold, with help of the cozy fire and woolly blankets Sarah knitted herself. She could still have friends round for a bonfire over the coming season, Sarah thinks to herself. Spring is a wonderful time to gather outside by the warmth of a crackling fire. But for now, the area rests quietly with the beautiful meadow and mountain backdrop. As she continues to cast her gaze over the field, she notices something furry and white nestled in the grass. Sarah looks closer and her heart swells as she realizes it's a bunny. They love the mountains here, and although she sees them quite often at this time of year, they still never fail to brighten her day. At Sarah's cabin, there is a set of stairs that leads down to ground level. She follows them, and the wood creaks with every other step. The sound causes the bunny to notice her, and it darts off into the pine forest. Sarah looks down at her feet, focusing on the earth below them. The grass is still young, coming back from the cold days of winter, but it looks vibrant and healthy. She walks towards the field, feeling the dewy soil underneath her shoes with every step. She is grateful for the dampness, because she knows it's going to create a season overflowing with color and new growth. As she gets closer to the meadow, she begins to smile even wider. She can see a group of small wildflowers beginning to blossom. Sarah crouches down and leans in to get a closer look. The green buds look ready to burst and to showcase their colors. Typically, purple, pink, yellow, and white flowers grow in this meadow. 
they dance in the wind all season long. The flowers are a delight to watch from her porch as she sips her morning tea or coffee. It's one of her favorite pastimes. Sometimes, when she's feeling especially inspired, she spends the morning painting the scene with soft watercolors. She even has a painting of this view hanging in her hallway. Sarah thinks it might be a bit silly to have a painting hanging up on her wall of something she can look out her window and admire, but she keeps it there anyway. It makes her smile, and that is all that matters, she tells herself. Sarah stands back up and takes one more look at the budding flowers. Then, she decides to walk around the house to where the garden is located. She sees the resilient blue spruces that line the side of her house as she walks. Sarah made a careful effort to plant things that would be able to sustain the frigid winters in the mountains. The blue spruce not only survives, but it looks beautiful in doing so. She enters the backyard through a quaint gate that rattles as she opens it. She shuts the gate behind her and looks out at her beloved garden. White lattice panels are draped in English ivy, and next to them rests a small wooden table and a couple of chairs. There's a pathway with little stones on either side. Next to the path are plants and open spaces where Sarah can grow seasonal herbs and vegetables. Some of the plants are doing extremely well in these early spring days. She looks over at the section of catmint, an aromatic plant that resembles lavender, and is delighted to see its purple tips basking in the sun. Some of her plants will come back on their own, like mint, lavender, and sage. Others, like basil, carrots, and lettuce, she will have to replant in the coming days. Against the wall of her cabin, she has a shed with some gardening essentials. She strolls over to it and pulls out a trowel or tiny shovel that she can use to check the soil and uncover any budding plants. Sarah makes her way to the section of the garden that houses the mint. This is one of her favorite herbs to keep. It's fast growing and adds a delicious flavor to teas and some of the dishes she likes to cook. Sarah bends down not worried about getting dirt on her knees, and inspects the plants. She uses her hands and the trowel to search for new mint. Mint has a habit of spreading and taking over gardens, so it's often one of the first plants to show up in spring. If there is a new plant, she would like to pot it and give it to one of her neighbors. 
in this rural mountain village, the community is such an essential part of what makes it a sustainable and enjoyable place to call home. All of her neighbors like to trade things with one another. For example, one makes candles, another makes wooden furniture, another has chickens and shares their fresh eggs. Sarah grows plants and knits all sorts of cozy things. Sarah feels the sun against her back and the cool, damp soil on her knees and hands as she searches for the mint. After just a few moments, she feels a small root She stands up, shakes her hands, and wipes the clumps of earth off her knees. By the shed, there are a few ceramic pots. Sarah grabs one, and then pulls open a bag of soil, and uses the trowel to scoop some into the pot. Once the pot is about halfway full, she makes her way back to the mint. Sarah carefully sticks the trowel into the mud and gently scoops up the root and surrounding clump of soil. She uses her fingertips to make a spot in the center of the pot and softly places the plant inside. She fiddles with the dark brown soil until the root is resting in just the right place. What a perfect spring present, Sarah thinks. Back inside the kitchen, Sarah has wooden lollipop sticks that she can use to make handwritten signs for her plants. She'll make one and put it in this pot as a gift for her neighbor. She wipes her hands together once again to remove excess soil and carries the ceramic pot toward the back door of the cabin. Sarah goes up the few creaky steps hidden in the shade as she makes her way to the door, which leads straight into the kitchen. Like the rest of her cabin, the kitchen is mostly made of wood. It boasts rustic decor and hanging plants. A lingering aroma of lavender invites her in, but Sarah remembers to kick off her shoes before going into the main part of the house. Once inside, she places the pot on the counter and pulls open one of the drawers below it. Bits and bobs and kitchen supplies rustle against her hand as she searches for the lollipop sticks and a marker pen. She quickly finds both and writes mint vertically on the light brown stick, which she then carefully pokes into the pot. Content with her work, Sarah drops the pen back in the drawer and pushes it closed, leaving the plant on the counter. Bringing her hands up to her face, she looks at the way her time in the garden has left its mark on them. She admires the soil nestled in the creases of her skin. 
she moves over to the metal sink and pushes down on the top of a bottle of hand soap. The fresh aroma of citrus fills her senses. She rubs her hands together, lathering each finger. The liquid quickly begins to foam up and Sarah continues to rub her palms, taking a moment to focus on every crease in her skin. She then turns on the tap and runs her hands under the warm water. Sarah takes her time washing her hands, making sure they are totally clean before drying them on a linen kitchen towel. This vibrant spring day has been both productive and inspiring for Sarah. And now she wants to relax. Making her way down the hall, she hears the record player still chiming a happy tune. Sarah smiles and dances lightly along with the song as she places her hat on the coat rack. Though Sarah imagines she could easily go back to dancing in the living room like she did this morning while cleaning, she decides against it. It's time to focus on pure relaxation. As she walks over to the record player, she sees that the sunshine isn't as bright as it was the last time she was in this room. Turning towards the window, she notices that the wind feels a bit cooler as it rustles the curtains. Beyond the curtains, the sky has transformed. There still aren't any clouds, but now it's filled with deep shades of orange and pink, like the colors of tropical fruits. It's an idyllic scene like something out of a painting. She pushes the window down to close it, and the dancing curtains fall still. She can't believe how fast the day has gone by. Now that evening has arrived, it's time to put on some soothing music. She continues walking over to the record player, removes the album, and puts on a more mellow and relaxing one. Next, she makes her way over to the large cushioned sofa. There are a couple of pillows on it, and she places them both on the right side. She lies down, propping her head on the stack of pillows and gazing out at the dreamy setting sun. In this moment, Sarah feels completely at peace and content. She rests her hands on her belly and feels her deep breaths coming in and out rhythmically. As she does this, she slowly closes her eyes. She thinks about how enchanting this time of year is in these mountains. 
the soft sun and gentle wind, the blooming flowers and the rugged landscape that surrounds her. They all help make spring one of the most beautiful seasons here. Sarah continues to daydream about the coming weeks. She will probably visit the farmer's market this weekend and bring friends around for a cozy bonfire. Hopefully, it will be an evening with another fiery sunset like this one. As her mind continues to wander, Sarah feels her body moving towards sleep. The soothing music in the background slowly fades away as Sarah drifts into a magical dream. Welcome to the Amazon Rainforest. It's divided by the longest river in the world, which surges across more than 6,000 kilometers of the South American continent. In the rainforest, there's a constant buzz in the humid air. These are the sounds of the countless animals and insects that live here, communicating through chirps, clicks, and whistles. Over a million species coexist in this fascinating place. Moving away from the river, the forest thickens, There are narrow mud paths trodden into the earth, surrounded by a maze of vegetation. Guarded by the dense foliage, the creatures that live here are in their own private world. They move freely through the forest, up and through the trees. The monkeys of the Amazon can usually be found up towards the canopy, swinging from branch to branch. But right now, a large black howler monkey is ambling across the ground near the riverbank. He moves nimbly through the dust on all fours. Across the river, a jaguar watches the howler monkey. She remains still for a moment, sensing her surroundings with her powerful nose. Then, she decides to move towards the water to get closer to the monkey. Smooth rocks emerge above the surface of the gushing river, placing one paw after the other. The jaguar tries to maintain her balance on the cool stones. Her long claws scratch the rocks with each step. This sound attracts the monkey's attention. He turns around, searching for the source of the noise. Meanwhile, the jaguar sinks onto the rocks in the river. 
The refreshing coolness of the water seeps into the fur on her stomach, while the muggy forest air warms her back. This perfect combination of heat and chill calms the jaguar, and her breathing slows. As she breathes, her stomach slides back and forth along the cool rocks. She closes her eyes and relaxes for a moment. The rich scents of the rainforest waft towards her nose, and she breathes in all of the aromas. When she opens her eyes, she sees that the monkey has wandered off into the trees. But the jaguar doesn't mind. The Amazon is the most biodiverse place on Earth, there are plenty of other animals to look at. Now, another smell approaches. It's a strange aroma, both sweet and sharp. The jaguar turns and looks through the trees behind her, wondering who this scent belongs to. And as she looks up, she sees it, the anaconda. The huge snake hangs from the lower branches of a tree. Its sparkling greens and blacks shimmering in the light. The smooth scales are covered with an ornate pattern of black shapes. The anaconda is at ease here, hanging patiently from the tree. It could happily linger here all day. There's only one creature that can dislodge it from its resting place. The jaguar inhales deeply, then lets out a roar. The noise echoes through the trees, sounding more powerful with each reverberation. All of the nearby animals scurry away. Sensing these vibrations, the snake quickly slithers into the forest in search of a more peaceful tree branch. Settling down on the rocks again, the jaguar is cushioned by a spongy moss. Overhead, some macaws squawk happily as they soar through the air, carried by the wind. The golden parakeets then soar up into the light where they're unburdened by the humidity of the trees. Occasionally, they even burst through the top of the silky mist above the canopy. The glorious sunlight shines on their vivid yellow plumage, so each feather resembles a sunflower petal. Then, the birds go back into the mist, enjoying their exhilarating dash through the sky. After flapping for so long, their wings begin to feel loose and tired. The parakeets drift down towards the trees, dropping comfortably through the mist and back into the forest. To the birds, this place smells like home. The fresh greenery is mixed 
with the comforting scents of their nests. In one of these nests, polished eggs are blanketed by fragrant leaves, keeping the chicks warm. The mother parakeet cradles an egg in the crook of her powerful wing, knowing they will hatch in the next day or two. At dusk, the sunlight fades, and the parakeets settle down to roost. There's a buzz in the air during this beautiful twilight period. Both the nocturnal and diurnal animals seem to be awake. Nocturnal animals are those who sleep during the day and are awake at night, while diurnal animals rise and move with the sun. And then, among all the noises of the forest, there's a quiet, tinkling sound. One of the parakeet eggs now has a maze of thin cracks. A small ivory beak pokes out of the shell, swiveling around. Slowly, the beak pushes around the edge of the shell, feeling for a weaker part. Then, with a majestic shattering, the newborn chick emerges from the egg. One by one, the other chicks hatch. By morning, five golden birds are huddled in the nest, hopping about as they encounter life. Their excited flitting is accompanied by happy, carefree squawks as they find their voices for the first time. The proud parents gaze lovingly at their chicks, but the adult parakeets can't stay in the nest for too much longer. It's time to find something to eat. So, off they fly again, searching for something tasty and nutritious to feed their young. In the shrubbery below, they spot some plants with tiny leaves. They look fresh and small enough for the young chicks to eat. The birds pluck off some of the leaves, and then soar into the air. On their way back to the nest, the parakeets fly over the river. Down below, a caiman floats slowly along. This impressive reptile is a member of the alligator family. With his long body lying flat in the water, he resembles a log. He basks in the fresh, cool water, idle and unbothered. The gentle current is gradually tugging the caiman downstream. As he relaxes in the river, enjoying the soft breeze, he swishes his long tail lazily. Every now and then, he dips his head beneath the surface and lets the refreshing water run across his snout. After lounging in the river for a while, the caiman paddles over to the verdant bank, which is covered with shrubs. 
The earth here feels squishy, with soft mud clinging to the deep-rooted trees. The caiman slowly climbs over the mushy ground, then settles down comfortably in a sunny spot. This spongy bank is an ideal bed, with the dappled sunlight warming his body, the caiman begins to relax, feeling a serene weightlessness. He relaxes his legs, closes his eyes, and slowly drifts towards sleep. As the caiman dozes by the river, the sunlight trickles down through the trees, warming the ground. Now another creature comes to explore the sunny riverbank, a young taper. This hoofed mammal looks a little bit like a brown pig with a long snout. He has a sleek, short-haired coat with a remarkable pattern of white stripes and spots. When the curious young taper catches the sight of the sleeping caiman, he moves closer. He's never seen such a large reptile before. The taper sniffs inquisitively around the riverbank and makes an endearing squealing noise full of curiosity. His coarse hooves squelch through the mud as he moves towards the caiman. Just then, the mother taper arrives. She's much larger than her calf and has a sleek grey coat that ripples as she moves. The mother taper communicates with her child using a unique series of clicks and whistles. She tells him to stay by her side and ushers him away from the caiman's resting spot. Then the pair of tapers trot off back to the safety of the forest. With the tapers gone, the caiman is left to bask alone in the sun, enjoying the peaceful solitude for a while. But nearby, the rainforest is teeming with life. A small grey opossum wanders across the ground, and a bulbous toad hops by. There are all kinds of amphibians in the Amazon rainforest, including a variety of glass frogs. One of them is hopping along right now in a nearby clearing. From a distance, she looks like any regular frog, with smooth green skin and spindly fingers and toes. The webbing on her feet allows her to jump more easily from tree to tree. A long pink tongue is rolled up inside her mouth, which is shaped into a thin-lipped smile. The frog uses her powerful throat to make a vibrating, riveting sound. This gliding melody harmonizes with the calls of her companions in the forest the poison dart frog, the golden-eyed tree frog, 
and the smoky jungle frog. Each has its own little tune of rolling croaks, providing the droning bass for the symphony of the rainforest. What makes the glass frog special is that she can camouflage herself, turning her skin transparent to avoid detection. It's a unique, entirely natural form of protection. Although they're not exactly a pack, the frogs often keep company, colonizing entire trees at a time. Sometimes they'll paddle about amongst the marshes together, keeping an eye on the colorful fish that swim past. The glass frog mostly lives a slow, peaceful existence. But these relaxing pauses during the day are building up to a thrilling flurry of action. When the frog jumps, she bends her spindly but powerful legs, launching herself into the air. All the tension from her body vanishes as she floats, arms and legs flapping in the breeze. The glass frog soars over the shrubbery. When she's airborne, her joints become wonderfully loose, and her entire body is relaxed. Then, the target tree approaches. Her sticky feet catch the leaf perfectly. Now, she can watch the joy of the other frogs bounding about, and catch her breath as she prepares to jump again. Later in the day, after a rest, the frog decides to look for a new adventure. She shimmies down the tree and moves towards the river. Here, the scales of orange fish glint in the sunlight. The fish sends small bubbles towards the surface, which make a glugging sound as they pop. Unleashing her springy legs, the frog dives into the river. She stays under the surface only briefly, soaking her dry body, then leaps out of the water. The frog sails through the air towards a twisted log sticking out of the river. As she perches on the gnarled wood, she can feel the ridges of the wet bark under her webbed feet. Below in the clear water, little grey tadpoles are wriggling around. A moment later, the frog is off again, diving into the depths to be with the tadpoles. They swarm around her, their movements creating minute currents. Then, after a quick swim, the frog springs up out of the water and draws in a long breath. All this movement is tiring. The frog needs to rest for a while so she bounds onto a nearby tree and sits on a low branch. Here, she catches sight of another creature who's also enjoying a rest. 
This motionless ball of fur is a sloth reclining on the tree branch. While the other creatures of the forest rush around, the sloth lives by his own clock. When he's finally ready to move, the sloth clings to the massive tree trunk, hooking into the sturdy wood with his long, smooth claws. He hugs the trunk tightly, feeling safe and secure here. Then, as he begins to climb, his small, beady eyes slowly look upwards. The sloth's eyesight is weak, and when he gazes in the direction of the distant canopy, it's little more than a blur. But he can use his powerful sense of smell and touch to navigate as he climbs the tree. Ambling onto a branch, the sloth's muscular limbs begin to feel heavy. Weary from climbing, the sloth lets his long arms and legs dangle freely. He feels the tension flowing down and disappearing. This branch is the perfect width, allowing the sloth's stomach to rest comfortably. He lets his furry body go limp, and his eyelids gently close. As he rests here in the shade, he's fanned by the branches that move in the breeze above him letting in occasional rays of sunlight. Even in his sleepy state, the sloth remains aware of his surroundings. His sensitive nose can still detect the scents of insects. He smells the ants and spiders on the forest floor and dragonflies near the riverbank. To the sloth, some insects are sweet, while others have a powerful, bitter scent. After a short rest, the sloth moves along the branch, shuffling back to the trunk he feels like a change of scenery, so he can experience a different branch, or even a different tree. The sloth enjoys testing all of nature's mattresses. But there's no rush, and he's cautious to avoid disturbing the peace of the other resting animals. He moves slowly and deliberately through the tree. On his way to the next branch, the sloth decides to stop for a snack. He rarely feels hungry, as his stomach is just as patient and unhurried as the rest of him. But these leaves look particularly tasty. So he reaches out and clutches a fistful. There's a soft crackle as he pulls the leaves from the tree. Then the sloth languidly brings the leaves towards his mouth and chews slowly, savoring the juicy taste. They are fresh, 
but they also have a spicy tang. He leans against the trunk, eyes closed, as he works through this meal. Now, resting on softer bark, the sloth wraps himself around another branch. This time, he's perched high up in the canopy, ready for a nice, long rest. Closing his eyes, the forest dims, and then, once again, the sloth drifts into sleep, dreaming of starry nights and beautiful sunrises. The colors were astounding. Lucy stood at the edge of the road, staring out into an expanse of pink, blue, lavender, and white. The field was full of hydrangeas. These had always been Lucy's favorite flowers. Their puffy round shape reminded her of popcorn. She peered up close at the delicate petals that made up the large blooms. They were absolutely beautiful. Hydrangeas were one of the many reasons Lucy loved traveling to Northern Ireland. She had arrived earlier that morning and was looking forward to reaching her destination, Carrickareed Island. Lucy's family was originally from Northern Ireland. With great pride, her grandmother would always tell stories of growing up as a fisherman's daughter. Lucy was excited to get back to her family's roots and explore the beautiful country. Carrickareed Island was a great start. She got into her car and started once again on the narrow, winding roads. The hydrangeas continued to follow her on her journey. The flowers' pink, blue, and purple hues contrasted with the bright green grass and the white houses. The road flowed up and down like a continuous, peaceful rhythm. She had both windows of her vehicle slightly lowered, just enough that a light wind brushed her hair back from her face. The air smelt fresh. It cleared her head of all the thoughts that sometimes bounced around. She was left with a calming peace and simple happiness. Lucy was enjoying the flow of the road and her refreshed mind when the sea came into view. This was where the edge of the county Antrim mainland met the Atlantic Ocean. 
Lucy's car was the only one on the road, so she slowed down to take in the view. The green hillside rolled down to meet grey cliffs peppered with flowers. Blue water stretched out for miles, with a couple of faint islands off in the distance. She could see birds circling above the cliffs. On top of the hill, a couple sat on a bench, with their heads leaned against one another, facing the scene. It was a magical sight from afar, and Lucy couldn't wait to experience it up close. She continued down the winding road to a steep, paved driveway. At the bottom, she found a gravel-surfaced car park. Lucy stepped out of her car, and as she made her way to a smooth dirt path, all the sights came alive with sound. The cliff tops were lined with tall cattails. The plants made a light swooshing noise as the breeze swept over them. There were delicate, tall pink flowers sprinkled among the beige cattails. As the wind whooshed in and out, It felt as if the whole cliffside was taking smooth, deep breaths. Birds circled above, making light cooing noises. In the ocean, a little way off from the shoreline, there was a large rock. The top of this rock was covered in perched birds, which were various shades of grey and white. They took turns swooping down past the cliffs to touch the water below. They seemed like they were calling to each other as they passed. Lucy took a moment to just enjoy watching them converse with one another. Below, the waves crashed against the rocks with a perfect crescendo and decrescendo, louder, then softer. They came in and out. Lucy closed her eyes and for a moment matched her breath to the cadence of the waves. When she opened her eyes, she watched the water meet the rocks and spray up into the air, before flowing back out to the sea. The sunlight caught these droplets adding sparkle to them before they rejoined the swaying body of water. To the left, the cliffside stretched out as far as the eye could see. To the right, the cliffs jutted out into a point. That was where she was heading the Isle of Karakarit. Lucy began making her way towards her destination. She slowed as a wonderful, warm and cozy smell drifted to her nose. Her stomach started to rumble. 
Then she noticed a small white building with a black tin roof. She was in no rush, so she walked over, following the delicious smell. The menu was full of savory options. She decided to order a bacon roll, as the colorful, neat writing on the chalkboard noted it was the most popular item. With the roll in hand, Lucy walked over to the slatted bench and sat down. Then she bit into her delicious treat. It was hot and salty with a slight sweetness. The dough surrounding the filling was perfectly flaky and melted in her mouth as she bit down. As Lucy savored her snack, a park worker led a tour group to a nearby bench. She overheard the charismatic woman telling the small crowd that the rock to the left was a bird sanctuary. That explained the wonderful bird community that Lucy had spotted earlier. The woman went on to note what a beautiful, clear day it was. And she was right. The sun was beaming high in the sky but it was not too hot as a cool breeze rushed in and out over the land. There were white puffy clouds in the sky above. It was a perfect day. The tour guide went on to say that normally you could not see Rathlin Island off in the distance. She pointed to the right. Lucy could see the faint outline of an island. The woman said that the cloud cover was usually so thick that fishermen joked that Rathlin Island was made up. She laughed heartily at the passed down joke, and Lucy smiled. The guide explained that Carricka Reed was famous for the rope bridge connecting it to the mainland. There was only one building on the island, a fisherman's cottage. The woman ended her speech by explaining the importance of this location. She spoke about how they limited entry to keep the foot traffic low on the trails. This would help to preserve the site and keep it in good condition for future visitors. Then she pointed to the path that led to the island. Lucy threw the wrapper in a bin near the trail entrance. Then she adjusted her backpack and set out onto the trail. The path was made up of compact dirt with small pebbles throughout. Her boots rolled smoothly on the ground. To her left, she could hear the whistle of the cattails. Dark burgundy flowers were dotted here and there between them. Then a burst of bright yellow flowers with perfectly rectangular petals appeared among them. All the flowers swayed back and forth in the cool breeze. 
the ocean's melody continued below as it met its rock counterpart, and the birds were still cooing above as they circled around and took turns swooping down to the water. Away from the cars and the people, it felt like Lucy had stepped into a magical bubble of perfect bliss. She continued a few paces forward, where the fence to her right stopped. A rolling hill came into view. Lush, tall green grass danced in the wind, moving to the same rhythm as the flowers on her left. Across the hillside, puffs of white were sprinkled throughout the dancing strands of green. As her eyes adjusted to the brightness, Lucy realized the white puffs were grazing sheep. She stepped closer. A couple of sheep stood munching grass side by side. Then she noticed the sheep were marked with paint. One had a blue circle on its hip, while the other had a pink circle. Lucy knew that farmers marked their sheep this way for identification. She chuckled at the presence of the bright colors among the greenery. Standing there for a moment, she watched as the sheep grazed peacefully. Off in the distance, other sheep slowly walked around, raising their heads occasionally to reveal varying facial patterns of black and white. They looked so content. Lucy continued to walk along the rolling hills, dotted with sheep on her right, and tall, colorful flowers to her left. The path began to slope down, and between the flowers, an opening became visible. Lucy paused for a moment there to see the shoreline. The cliffs were high and deep and very smooth. They looked as if the rock had been scooped away with a straight shovel. At the bottom of the cliffs, there were rocks of different sizes that led out into the Atlantic Ocean. The water flowed in and out. Its cadence was different from that of the greenery and flowers that surrounded her. It felt as if the flowing grass and the waves were singing back and forth to one another. Lucy stood there for a moment delighted by the view of the water from this angle. A rainbow sprung up from the rock as the sun caught a glistening spray of water. This was by far the most beautiful shoreline she had ever seen. Lucy continued to walk down the path and rounded a corner near the famous rope bridge. It moved peacefully, high above the waves. The bridge was sturdy, as it was made of thick rope 
and strong wood. Lucy stepped out on the smooth wooden slats and began to walk. Midway, she stopped and looked to her left. Again, she cast her gaze on the perfectly sculpted shoreline, with the ocean meeting the carved cliffs. On the other side of the rope bridge, there was a new sight. The rolling hills, topped with green grass, sloped down into the ocean below. There were no rocks to be met, just flowing grass. The grass seemed to grow darker in the shadows as it approached the magnificent hues of the ocean. The water had turquoise and royal blue shading, as well as bright blue. These colors shifted as the water flowed and lapped against the side of the hill. Lucy smiled and took a deep breath. Here on the rope bridge between the mainland of Antrim County and the island of Carrickareed, she could smell the saltiness of the Atlantic Ocean below, and the earthiness of the two pieces of land. Lucy cherished this moment. The rope bridge gave her and others the opportunity to experience land and sea all at once. Slowly, enjoying each step, she walked across the remainder of the bridge. She savored the smells and the continuous rhythm, as the landscape seemed to sway on either side of her. Smiling triumphantly, Lucy stepped off the bridge and onto the island she came to see. Reaching a steep hill, she began to climb, placing one foot in front of the other. With each step, she felt her muscles moving and working to support her ascent. She was very grateful for her body and all it was helping her see today. There was a viewing point just off the path, so she decided to take a break. After slipping off her backpack, she took out a bottle of water. The pack was insulated and had kept the water fresh and cold. There was a rock that was perfect for sitting, facing the way she had just come. Any other person might question why the rock was not facing the ocean. But Lucy took a seat looked back at the route she had taken to get here, and smiled. Her path through the grass was neatly outlined in a golden orange color. The grass was a mixture of hunter green and brighter patches. As Lucy sat on the rock, The moving clouds cast different shading on the greenery and ocean below. 
she watched the shades flow all around her. It was a perfect piece of ever-changing art, and she was so thankful to be able to sit in it. She wanted to take a mental snapshot of this moment. Then she noticed that the grass in front of her was padded down, as if multiple people had walked there. She got up and took a step forward. Down below, there were zigzag steps leading to the only building on the small island. It was a white wooden cottage with a dark green roof. Lucy recalled the park worker explaining that the only building on the island was a fisherman's cottage. She was surprised by its small size. There was a rope blocking off access, and she suspected that fishermen had not used this small cottage in quite some time. Lucy took another sip of her cold water and stretched her arms out to her sides. Feeling refreshed and rejuvenated, she decided to continue on her journey. And after only a couple of paces up the hill, she arrived at the top of the island. The footpath stopped at a patch of grass. This was the grass that seemed to have been waving to her for the entire climb. Bending down and pressing her hand to the ground, she noticed that the grass was soft and plush. To feel fully connected with the earth around her, Lucy decided to take off her hiking boots. Sitting down, she began to unlace them. After pulling her boots off each foot, she stretched out her legs. Then she pulled her knees to her chest and began to roll off her socks. She wiggled her toes in the cool breeze and felt a subtle but delightful chill go up her spine. Lucy pressed her feet into the grass. It felt as if she was placing them on a pile of thin string. Taking a moment to squirm her toes into the ground, she felt a slight dew beneath the top layer. Standing slowly, Lucy took a moment to feel her body connect to the ground beneath her. The wind moved all around her, picking up strands of her hair as they danced in rhythm with the swaying grass. Lucy felt in that moment that she was part of this Irish shore. She was part of the fabric that made up Carrickareed Island, and she knew for certain that it was now part of her. Lucy touched the cladder ring on her finger. Her father had given it to her on her twelfth birthday. It was sterling silver 
and was made up of two hands holding a heart, with a crown perched on top of the heart. It stood for love, loyalty, and friendship, three values that Lucy lived by. As she stood with the wind and the land, she traced the symbols of the ring. She had never felt more connected with her Irish heritage than in that moment. Lucy savored her rooted state. She closed her eyes and let herself be fully present. She took a deep breath in and then exhaled slowly. Then she opened her eyes and looked towards the ocean. She could see the outline of Rathlin Island off in the distance. She was thankful for the clear weather that allowed her to see this often elusive landmass. The water stretching out to meet Rathlin Island was a curious bright blue and contrasted well with the dark grayish blue of the island's outline. As Lucy stepped closer to the edge of Karakareed Island, dark rocks came into view below, with spots of yellow and green moss covering them. A couple of white pelicans sat on one of the rocks, looking out at the ocean. Another bird flew in to join them. This bird was grey, but had intricate dotted patterns along its wings. To Lucy's delight, one of the pure white pelicans flew up from the rock below, landing right by where she was standing. The grey bird followed. The white pelican then walked along the edge of the island cliff, pushing its head forward as it moved. Then it paused and looked at the grey bird behind it. This bird followed the white pelican and copied its exact walk. The two continued to stroll around and mimic each other. Lucy found herself letting out a giggle as the birds flew away. She decided to take a moment to rest and lie down on the soft bed of grass. It felt as if she was lying on a fluffy cloud. She let her body sink into the cushy surface. In the sky above her, puffy white clouds moved slowly across a backdrop of light blue. She remembered finding shapes in the clouds as a child. Lucy decided to close her eyes and imagine she was floating on one of the clouds above. She listened to the waves go in and out. And after a while, her mind cleared. She was fully present and at one with the nature 
that surrounded her. Feeling rested and immersed in a state of peace, Lucy slowly sat up. She knew that she would need to journey back to her car soon, but she decided to admire the ocean a little longer. Way out in the distance, the sun hit the horizon in a way that made the water shimmer. A golden hue started to cast itself all around her. Even the grass was shining. The light made the scene so picturesque. Lucy realized that this whole time she had not taken a single photo. After digging through her backpack, she found her digital camera. She turned it on, and the lens rolled out smoothly, ending with a slight click. Positioning the camera towards Rathlin Island, she pressed the button. Lucy loved taking photos and knew she would cherish these once she returned home. Standing up, she turned in a slow circle, taking snapshots of the beautiful scenery that surrounded her. She knew all too well the pictures would not do the sights justice. But later, the images would take her mind back to this peaceful adventure. She was glad she had taken the time to fully live in this moment. When she was finished, She walked over to where she had laid her boots and socks. She looked out at the sea as she slipped them back on. She welcomed the warmth of the boots as the breeze had turned cooler with the sun going down. She took one last sweeping glance around her. Her eyes moved over the outline of Rathlin Island, then towards the rolling green hills that seemed to flow into the bright ocean below. There was the grass and the grazing sheep way above the path she was about to take. Finally, she gazed at the shoreline with the bird sanctuary off in the distance. Everything was covered in a blanket of golden light. Lucy slowly made her way back down the hill. She passed the small fisherman's cottage and arrived at the rope bridge. As she stepped off Karikareed Island and onto the bridge, she felt as if she was seeing new scenery. Earlier, the water had splashed up white foam that transformed into a rainbow. Now it was a golden liquid. It looked like melted butter. And this time, along with the salt of the ocean and the earthiness in the air, there was a coolness as well. 
Lucy made her way across the bridge to the mainland, and was met with grass shimmering in the evening sun. She continued the hike, taking pictures along the way, and she listened to the cooing of the birds, the rustling grass, and the crashing of the waves below. Lucy thought of her great-grandfather walking pathways like this every day as he went to fish. He would have walked across the soft grass just like Lucy did today. Pausing, she took another deep breath in, and then slowly breathed out. As she stood there, she concentrated on how grateful she was. She was grateful for the journey to the shoreline, for the hike, and for her connection to the island. Feeling full in many ways, Lucy once again traced her cladder ring, and she knew that Karika Reed would forever hold a special place in her heart. The street lamps glow with a warm yellow light. Although you're in a large city, you can still just about detect the familiar hum of crickets beneath the urban soundscape. There are the distant sounds of traffic and people making their way along other streets heading to dinner before a late night show or just out for an evening stroll. But the side street you're on is quiet. A car passes by every now and then, but for the most part, you've only seen a handful of people walking their dogs or on their way to more bustling avenues. In front of you, a tall building with a glass facade stretches up towards the darkening sky. Passing clouds overhead are illuminated by the lights of the city, which paint them in shades of white, amber, pink, and even blue in some places. For a moment, You turn your back to the building and look to the skyline beyond your street. The city sprawls out around you on all sides. Little lights twinkle on and off as people come and go from the office, back home, or maybe to visit a friend. Those working the night shift are just starting their day. You see a few lights flicker on in skyscrapers in the distance, just as others dim. There's always so much life and vitality in a city, you think. It's invigorating in a way knowing there are thousands of other people out there 
living their lives just as you are. Although you only know a handful of people here, you feel connected to everyone sharing this part of your life's journey with you, even from afar. With a sigh of contentment, you turn back to the building whose glass reflects the lights of the city and the night sky with its ethereal clouds. There is no sign to mark the reflective surface in front of you, just a number. You found the address almost by accident. It was written on a flyer affixed to a street lamp with tearaway tabs hanging off the bottom, advertising a place enticingly called the Rooftop Spa. With no other plans set for this evening, you figured it would be the perfect time to come and see this curious place for yourself. The door is made of mirrored glass. Although you can tell there are lights on within the building, you can't see anything but your own reflection and that of the city behind you. A long, polished metal bar serves as a handle. There's no time like the present, you tell yourself, and you reach out your hand and gently push open the door. The soothing glow of warm white lighting greets you as the glass door swings inward. You step inside, letting the door close softly behind you. For a moment, you stand still and take in your surroundings as your eyes adjust to the light after the darkness of night outside. You seem to be standing in an elegant lobby. There are a few plants in large white ceramic pots on either side of the door. Each plant has tall, fern-like leaves that add a charming touch of green to an otherwise white and cream-colored space. Ahead of you is a bank of elevators. Each one is decorated with gold trim. The same shiny gold also colors the buttons to push for going up or down, and the light fixtures overhead. As far as you can tell, there's nothing else here in the lobby. No reception desk, no hallways leading to other places. Just the elevators and you. The floor is marble, and your footsteps echo lightly as you make your way towards the nearest lift. You consider for a moment before pressing the button with the arrow pointing up. You are going to the rooftop spa, after all. Within seconds, a delicate chiming noise lets you know the gleaming white doors will be opening soon. When they do, they reveal a glass elevator within trimmed with gold. Everything shines as though it's all been recently polished. You step inside and turn to face the panel of buttons. At the very top, you find one marked 
with the simple letter R. Elegant engraving beside it reads Rooftop Spa. You push it gently and hear the same delicate chime before the doors close. With only a whisper as it engages, the glass lift begins whisking you up to the topmost floor. As it carries you higher at an easy pace, you are given the chance to fully appreciate how this building was designed. The transparent panelling provides the perfect view through the glass exterior of the building itself. You watch, mesmerized, as the city spreads out beneath you, its lights twinkling on to the horizon. This long after sunset, you see there's only the faintest glimmer of the evening sun in the far distance. A deep orange blue that's fading to black as night takes hold. Looking up above the spires and towers of the city, above the apartments, shops, billboards and office towers, you see a night sky dotted with twinkling stars. A few long, lingering clouds drift slowly over the city, reflecting its light back to it as they pass. The view is truly spectacular. With every floor you ascend, you can see more of the city. Taxis and other vehicles grow smaller as you climb until they're just multicolored specks far below. Traffic lights and illuminated signboards look more like fairy lights from up here. So small they could decorate a window at home. You glide upwards as though you're going to meet the stars until the elevator slows to an easy halt. The delicate chime sounds again. When the doors open this time, you find yourself in an elegant waiting area. Each corner of the room is decorated with large, leafy plants, like the ones downstairs. A few hanging vines grace the walls behind them. On one side you see a check-in desk. In the same fanciful script engraved inside the lift, you see the name, the Rooftop Spa, emblazoned in gold on the front of it. The wall behind the desk is covered from floor to ceiling in a stunning waterfall fountain. Curtains of water stream down the glass into a small pool at the bottom. For a moment, you close your eyes and take in the quiet flow of the water. The sound of the fountain puts your mind at ease. You take a deep breath in, welcoming the newfound sense of calm into your body, and then let it out feeling refreshed. When you open your eyes again, 
you see that there is now someone standing behind the desk to greet you. She smiles at you warmly and invites you to come over. You tell her about finding the address of the spa and how the name made you curious to come and see what it has to offer. Many people end up here that way, she tells you. It's somewhat of a hidden gem, she adds, saying that she's glad you found your way here tonight. She explains that there are many offerings, but the one she always recommends to newcomers is the Starlight Special. You'll have time to enjoy one of the best rooms here at the spa, and end with a dip in the pool under the stars. It sounds perfectly relaxing, you tell her. She hands you a robe and some complimentary slippers, then points you to a hall on the left. That's where you'll begin once you're ready, she says. You thank her for her time, and with a contented smile, make your way down the hall. The first door leads you to a changing room. You put on the robe, which is unbelievably soft and snugly. It has large pockets and a deep hood, which you pull up and rub gently against your cheeks, enticing a satisfied smile to cross your face. Sliding the hood back down again, you step into the matching slippers which are the perfect size. Then, you sit down on a simple, yet elegant bamboo bench. It looks as if it's been made from a single piece of wood, bent and carved into just the right shape. You follow the lines of the bench in your mind, considering how it might have been made, and feel your mind drifting into restful thoughts, lingering concerns from the day have evaporated in the tranquil environment of this place. Now, your mind is open to curiosity and creative tangents. It's as though your mind and body both have a chance to breathe in and out, in and out, without rushing to keep pace with a busy day. As you breathe, you notice the soothing scent of lavender in the air, bringing with it a wave of relaxation that spreads throughout your body. You feel your eyes closing as you focus on the gentle scent. You are fully present in this moment, in these surroundings, here at the rooftop spa. Soon, you hear the sound of quiet footsteps in the hall, and open your eyes. The woman who greeted you earlier has returned to take you to the first spa room. You stand up from the bamboo bench, and follow her down the hall. She turns right, guiding you to a dimly lit room on the left. 
Once your eyes have adjusted to the lower lighting, she ushers you into an adjoining room that takes your breath away. Two entire walls of the room are made of glass. You can almost see the whole city from up here. At its center is a hot tub with bubbling jets. The water has been scented with lavender, which is carried by the steam throughout the room. A narrow bamboo path leads from the doorway to the tub. But the most striking part of the room is the glittering display of candles. Hundreds of white pillar candles decorate the floor. Their flames flicker and dance, reflecting in the glass and mirroring the lights of the city outside. Looking up, you see the ceiling is made of mirrored glass, creating the illusion of stars twinkling in the night sky with every candle flame. For as long as you'd like, this room is yours, she tells you. You gaze in awe at the candlelit scene and then thank her before she leaves the room. You make your way down the bamboo path, between rows and rows of glimmering candles. The way each flame moves slightly differently from all the rest reminds you of fireflies blinking in the night. At the end of the path is the tub, which is perfectly square. It's raised off the ground and lined on the outer edge with bamboo slats that serve as benches should you want to take a break from the tub. The calming scent of lavender is strong here but not overpowering. If you close your eyes, you can imagine you're standing in a field of lavender bushes, swaying in a midsummer breeze. But soon, the steam and gentle sound of the jets bring you out of your reverie and back to the present moment. You take a deep breath in, feeling the way the fragrant air enters your nose, and then exhale, detecting the complexities of the aroma as it mixes with the steam. Now you're ready to step in. You rest for a moment on the bamboo bench along the edge before slowly dipping your feet into the tub. Warmth spreads through your whole body as soon as the bubbling, frothing water touches the soles of your feet. Not wanting to rush the process, You dangle your feet just at the top of the water, feeling the bubbles roil and churn beneath your toes. Then you calmly lower your feet into the water, first the soles, then your toes and heels, all the way up to your ankles. 
you shift your weight on the bench until the water reaches your shins and calves. And finally, you decide the time has come. You lower yourself completely into the tub, giving in to the clear, lavender-scented water as it surrounds and supports your body. After a few moments, you shift until the jets are gently massaging your lower back and shoulder blades. With every stream of bubbles and hot water, you feel your muscles loosen and relax. Once you're settled, you gaze out through the glass at the city below. Skyscrapers look down over apartment blocks, which tower above parks filled with bushy-looking trees that glow silver in the moonlight. The cars move in streams of headlights and taillights, white and red as they crisscross the busy streets. Up above, light from the city sets the sky aglow though you can still see a wonderful collection of stars peeking out from behind the wayward clouds, drifting across the nighttime expanse. For a while, you get lost in the tranquility of this moment. You aren't sure how long you spend in the bubbling hot tub watching the city sparkle down below. But eventually, you feel you could move on to another part of the spa. It's warm in this tub, and something cooler might be nice to finish off your relaxing evening. You climb out of the hot tub, and wrap your soft robe around you, snuggling down into its fuzzy embrace. Soon, the woman from the desk returns. The last experience of the night will be happening outside, she says with a smile. It's an intriguing thought, and you're excited to see where you're going next. She leads you out of the candlelit room and down another hallway. At the end of the hall, she pushes a long metal bar to open a glass door. You follow her through the door and onto the rooftop. There's a light breeze out here that makes you grateful for your warm, snuggly robe and matching slippers. It isn't too cold, though. It's perfect for this kind of night. She continues on past wicker armchairs, decorated with plump cushions past a handful of plants in the same white ceramic pots, and past a couple of day beds, perfect for lounging out here in the afternoon. She stops in front of the most stunning swimming pool you've ever seen. It's an infinity pool that gives swimmers the illusion of being right at the edge of the roof. And, of all the places you've seen tonight, it has the very best view 
of the city. Again, you're welcome to use it for as long as you'd like, she tells you, before heading back inside. You thank her for all her kind hospitality, and then turn back to the pool. It's glowing a striking turquoise blue, with soft lights shimmering underneath the water. First, you dip your toe in to check the temperature. The pool is heated, so you don't have to worry about getting chilly up here on the roof. You take your time getting in, using a set of shallow stairs that lead down into the wading area. At the bottom of the steps, the water only comes up to your waist, so you decide to move to a deeper area. Soon, you're able to float. You bring your legs up underneath you and do a few lazy swells with your feet before lying back and floating with your eyes facing the sky. It is filled with so many stars tonight, it would be impossible to count them all, even if you floated here for hours. Instead, you find a few of your favorite constellations and watch the way the clouds drift in front of them on the gentle breeze. The warm water holds you like a cozy blanket as you drift across the surface of the pool, letting the gentle current take you where it will. You focus your mind on the way the water laps against your back, and the familiar scent of the pool and the steam rising from it in the night air. You focus on the stars and the clouds, the temperature and the many sensations on your skin. In this moment, you are grateful for all of the beauty that surrounds you, for the pool, the sky, and the city itself. And in your mind, you say a few words of kindness to yourself. After all, it was you who found this location and made the decision to try something new tonight. It can be easy to underestimate the power of small decisions, but tonight you feel gratitude for them and for the way they have led you to this wonderfully calming and centering place. This gratitude fills your mind with a sense of peace and tranquility. Your heart is full and open, once again feeling how interconnected you are with every other person in this city. This place is part of your life's journey now, as are all of the people bringing the city to life tonight.
you find your balance and sit up, paddling closer to the far end of the infinity pool. Here you rest your head on your arms and gaze out at the city and the stars in the night sky. You're welcome to stay here for as much time as you desire, and can head home to bed when you're ready for sleep. But for now, you'll enjoy the calming view and the feeling of the warm water around you. You are completely at peace, here at the rooftop spa. Maya was sitting in her kitchen. She set down her phone and stretched. Then she looked down at her phone on the table. Its screen shined brightly. She frowned a little. On second thought, she decided. She needed another degree of separation from the tempting little screen. So she turned it over, face down on the kitchen table in front of her. Outside her window was a lovely view. A plum tree was in bloom its branches dripping with tiny blossoms, their fresh white petals tinged with pink. Beyond it, a deep blue sky was dotted with lazily drifting clouds. Maya picked up her phone absent-mindedly and flipped it over to look at the screen. She tapped impatiently at her various chat and messaging apps, but nothing new and exciting had come in during the last, what, 30 seconds? Only the old messages were there, seeming to chide her for not having taken care of them yet. Then, Maya realized what she had just done. She shook her head a little and laughed softly at herself. And she put the phone back down, more firmly this time. She forced herself to look back out the window and focus on the lovely, though static, view. She had recently become aware that she didn't seem to be appreciating the world and her life quite the way she used to. She didn't seem to draw the same enjoyment from them and she felt that part of the blame for that lay with overusing her devices. The root problem, she felt, was that she'd slipped into the habit of rushing through life, focused on always getting something done. In the process, she'd lost the practice of spending time 
just being present in the moment, appreciating it. But a big contributor to that root problem was her devices, especially her phone, which went everywhere with her, and so easily intruded on every moment. Maya loved her phone, and was grateful to have it. She was very clear about that. It was a wonderful tool for getting things done and being productive, and for great entertainment too. She really appreciated the convenience, connection, and fun that it offered, and she didn't feel the least bit guilty about it. However, The fact that it was such a wonderful tool meant that sometimes it was a little too seductive. It was so tempting to constantly check it for anything important that the act of checking it became a task in itself. Checking the screen became something she felt constantly compelled to get done, even when there was nothing new or pressing for her to see. For this reason, Maya had decided to begin to limit herself, to challenge herself not to pick up the phone quite so often, and to try to rebuild her ability to just sit and be in a place for a few moments now and then. So, just a moment ago, she'd made herself a cup of fragrant tea, and she sat down in front of the window to enjoy the warm drink and contemplate the gorgeous day. It ought to be enough, she thought, a lovely view to observe, and sweet tea to sip. Yet, she kept feeling agitated, and this fact led her to a sudden decision. She would have to up the ante and go cold turkey. If she wanted to rediscover her joy and ability to live in the moment, she couldn't just make a half-hearted effort to occasionally stare out her kitchen window. She would need to take more drastic action to reset her mind and her habits. She would take a device-free vacation, she decided. Nothing big, nothing long, just a weekend. She could manage that, couldn't she? She thought about it while she finished the warm, aromatic tea. She got up and stretched, then slowly washed out her mug and patted it dry. Then she consciously chose to pick up her phone again, this time with a specific purpose. She went online and looked for rentals along the California coast not too far from where she lived. She browsed the options until she found what she was seeking. A simple cottage in a quiet stretch of land near the ocean with few amenities. 
it was located within a few hours drive of her home. Perfect. She checked her calendar and made a couple of quick calls to choose a good weekend to disconnect and go away. Then she clicked to book the cottage for a weekend towards the end of the month. Over the following weeks, Maya thought through what she wanted to accomplish during her weekend away. Her retreat, as she was coming to think of it. Her goals were simple, and yet also challenging. She wanted to retrain her mind to slow down and be comfortable without constant stimulation and input. To reprogram her brain to once again experience joy in the world's beauty, rather than always seeking jolts of adrenaline from a new notification or a new click. Over the rest of the month, She also continued to practice for her big retreat. For example, she left her phone at home when she took a short walk, or she put it in a drawer while reading a book, or even while watching a show on a larger screen. And so the week slid by and soon it was time for her weekend retreat. On the Friday afternoon of her trip, Maya set her phone down in her living room and took a deep breath. There was a landline at the cottage, and she'd given the phone number there to everyone who might need to reach her. Her phone would be waiting for her with all its joys and opportunities when she returned. For now, she was free to unplug. She took a moment to mentally congratulate herself for taking this course of action. Then she picked up her little overnight bag. It was a cute sage green duffel bag with a thick comfortable shoulder strap. It had kept her company on some fun overnight adventures in the past, and the memories of those accompanied her now as she headed out to her car. She buckled into the driver's seat and turned on the radio. A song she loved came on, and she was pleased to start her drive, listening to a favorite tune. She had to weave her way through traffic at first, but Maya consciously relaxed her shoulders and kept her breathing even. This was a favorite trick of hers, which never failed to make her feel calmer and more at ease behind the wheel. Maya found her mind wandering ahead as she navigated the turns of her route. She wondered what the cabin would be like in person, and what it would feel like to spend the weekend disconnected and on her own. She knew she might feel bored at times, but she welcomed that. 
she welcomed the challenge to sit with herself and the world, to practice acceptance and to stretch her mind to entertain itself. After driving for a while, she left the most urban part of her route behind. Now she was on a country highway with few lanes and less traffic. Open spaces began to line the road and she found herself breathing deeper at the sight of green fields and trees. Another favorite tune came on the radio, and she turned up the volume. She sang along to the familiar words. It looked like a lovely evening, and on a whim, she rolled down her window. As the breeze ruffled her hair, she realized she couldn't remember the last time she'd driven with the windows open. It felt wonderful and free. She'd been worried that the drive might be long and boring, but Maya realized she was smiling as she sped down the open road music playing, and the wind pulling at her hair. By the time she finished the drive and found the address she was looking for, she was feeling decidedly optimistic. She turned up a little dirt driveway and came to a stop in front of the cottage. It was unpretentious and charming, a small wooden cottage, spick and span, in fresh white paint, with a tulip magnolia tree blooming alongside the door. A covered porch ran all the way around the house, and there was a porch swing on one side. Maya climbed out of the car and shouldered her bag. A soft breeze was blowing, and she could smell the ocean not far away. She turned to look towards it, off on the other side of the road. A field sprawled there, and she knew if she crossed it, she'd reach a cliff overlooking a rocky beach. She was eager to explore the rugged, blustery coast of this part of Northern California tomorrow. For tonight, she would focus on getting settled. She found a lockbox where the owner had left her a key, and got into the cottage with no trouble at all. It was as cozy and welcoming inside as it had looked outside. The living room was surrounded by old-fashioned, multi-paned windows that let in the view. A comfortably worn, but scrupulously clean couch and armchair surrounded a fireplace. Between them, a beautiful lamp sat on an antique wooden side table, along with a local magazine and several nature guides to the area's wildlife. 
there was a simple and immaculate farm-style kitchen behind the living room on one side of the cottage. On the other side was a snug bedroom with an antique set of furniture painted a cheery yellow. A snowy down comforter billowed over fresh cotton sheets on the big bed. It looked like a wonderful place to rest. Maya looked forward to snuggling into the bed, but she was in no rush. She wanted to take a walk after her long drive, and she'd seen that there was a small market not far away. That would be just the place to pick up supplies for a simple dinner. She pulled on her warm jacket and picked up a shopping tote that the owner had thoughtfully left hanging in the kitchen. Then she stepped outside and struck out briskly in the direction of the market. The road was a simple affair that ran alongside the coastline, edged on one side by open fields and on the other by a smattering of houses with rambling yards. A cool wind swept across the fields from the ocean, bringing with it a wild, salty smell and a damp coolness that made Maya feel tremendously alive. She breathed it in deeply and images swelled into her mind of waves and tide pools, sea animals, and windswept rocks. She found herself stretching her arms out wide, letting the ocean wind blow over her. Already, she felt a world away from her daily life. She smiled into the slowly sinking sun high in the sky, way out over the ocean. The cloud-streaked sky was just turning a golden pink that foretold a beautiful sunset. She was eager to pick up the supplies for her meal and get home in time to watch it from the cozy cottage. In moments, she arrived at the little country market. A bell tinkled as she walked in and a man behind the counter looked up to greet her with a friendly smile. Maya walked the aisles and piled her selections into the shopping tote she'd brought with her. A bundle of asparagus, a pork chop from a local ranch, a couple of potatoes, and a basket of blueberries. She thought for a moment, then added half a dozen eggs, also from a local farm, and a twisted loaf of raisin cinnamon bread for breakfast. A quart of cream in a little glass bottle, and a stick of butter finished off her food selections. She would walk back to the market tomorrow 
for more supplies for that night's dinner. She paid the friendly man at the counter, then stepped back outside once more. The wind had an added chill now, and she pulled her warm coat snugly around her. There was something so free and exhilarating about being dressed cozily enough to be comfortable in cold weather, she thought. She relished the feel of the brisk coolness on her face, while the soft coat kept her comfortably warm. When she arrived back at the cottage, Maya hung her coat by the door, and then set the groceries on the counter. She pulled out a thick-bottomed frying pan and heated some butter in it, then tossed on the pork chop, which sizzled and began to let off a tempting smell. In another pan, she put the asparagus to steam in a little water. She washed one of the potatoes, cut it in half, and put it on a plate she found in the cupboard. It was lovely china, with a wreath of flowers around the edge. She popped the plate and potato into the microwave and set it to cook for several minutes. Then she washed the blueberries. As the pork sizzled and the asparagus gently steamed, she unpacked the rest of her groceries and stored them neatly in the refrigerator. After a few moments, her dinner was done. She poured herself a glass of water. Then she took the plate with the potato from the microwave and slid the pork chop and asparagus onto it. Scooping up a generous ball of butter, she plopped it on the potato, where it melted into a bright yellow pool, like liquid sunshine. She buttered the asparagus too, then picked up her dinner and made her way to a round table by the window. This looked out towards the west, the ocean, and the setting sun. As she cut into her food, she watched the sky turn into a rainbow of colors, from yellow gold to crimson to deep purple and navy. She made it a point to savor each bite as she contemplated the natural show she was witnessing in the sky. As she ate and watched, she thought of the farms where this good food was produced. She took time to be grateful for this meal and for all those who had made it possible. The setting sun was reduced to a glowing golden line on the horizon now. It sent out shining rays connecting the sky and the earth. Then it was gone, leaving a dusky beauty behind that made Maya 
catch her breath. Her meal was done, and she felt satisfied and peaceful. She returned to the kitchen and took her time cleaning her dishes and tidying up. Then she set a pot of water to boil. She selected a tea bag, lavender chamomile, from a caddy in the cupboard, and brewed herself a cup. It emitted a wonderfully calming, flowery fragrance, along with a comforting cloud of warm steam. She placed the cup of tea carefully on the table by the couch, then went to the bedroom and slipped into her pajamas. Taking a throw from the closet, she went back to the couch and curled up comfortably under the thick, soft fabric. She picked up one of the nature guides on the table and looked through it as she sipped her warm tea. She read about the animals she might see in this area. Harbor seals and sea otters, brown pelicans, elephant seals, and seagulls and cormorants as well as blue-banded hermit crabs, and perhaps even whales off the coast. Tomorrow she would explore. She would visit a nearby seal colony, examine the tide pools for sea stars and urchins, and scan the skies for seabirds. But tonight, she was perfectly content to relax in this cozy cottage. When her tea was done, Maya picked up the blanket and folded it into a square. She placed it on the floor and sat down on it. She closed her eyes and breathed intentionally in and out, in and out. With each breath in, she straightened and lengthened her spine, and with each breath out, She relaxed the muscles of her back, her jaw, her head, and her arms. For some time, she focused on her breathing, allowing her head to clear. When thoughts popped up, she observed them and released them, choosing to continually empty her mind and focus instead on the movement of her breath. When she was finished meditating, she stood slowly and stretched luxuriously. She reached up over her head, feeling her back muscles loosen and open up. Then, yawning deeply, she picked up her blanket and switched off the living room lights. She walked into the bedroom and finished preparing for bed. When she was ready, she slid under the comforter. 
the cotton sheets were soft and cool, and the thick comforter had a pleasing weight to it, despite its billowing, downy softness. She sighed with pleasure, feeling the cover's comforting weight, and the soft, smooth sheets enveloping her. Thank you, she told herself. Thank you for taking this time away. She had planned to read a book for a while, to let herself grow sleepy. But now, she wasn't so sure. It felt so luxurious just to be here, at rest, her mind stilled, and her body at ease, with nothing to do. Nothing at all to do. She let her eyes close, and just wallowed in the luxury of being at rest. Perhaps she would pick up her book in a little while, or perhaps not. It didn't matter. This moment was hers, to rest and restore her body and mind in whatever way felt right. And that was just right by her. The next morning, Maya sighed contentedly and rolled over in bed. Her eyes were still closed, but she could sense sunshine streaming in through the window. She felt a downy comforter lying over her and a cozy mattress supporting her body. Slowly, she remembered where she was. In a cottage along the coast of Northern California, close to the Pacific Ocean. She'd come here to get away from her daily routine and from modern technology, to reconnect with herself and the natural world. Today, she was looking forward to venturing further afield, exploring the rugged coastline, and hopefully spotting some of the various coastal wildlife in the area. She opened her eyes and saw the simple, white-walled room of the small cottage she'd rented for the weekend. She then sat up in bed and stretched her arms luxuriously over her head. Blue skies and tree branches were visible outside the bedroom window. The branches waved rhythmically with what looked like a gentle sea breeze. Maya breathed in deeply and exhaled with intention. Then she swung her feet over the side of the bed and her toes touched the cool, wooden floor. Fortunately, she had thought to bring her warm slippers, and she stepped into them now. 
she picked up her fluffy robe, which she had hung on the bedpost the night before, and wrapped it around her. Then she headed for the kitchen. Indirect sunlight gave the room a bright glow that made it pleasant and inviting. She decided to have breakfast before showering and dressing for the day. She was eager for the day's explorations, but there was no rush. So, she cooked herself a couple of the farm-fresh eggs she'd bought the night before, and brewed herself a cup of coffee. Picking up the steaming mug of dark coffee, she poured in cream from a small glass bottle that came from an organic Northern California dairy. She watched the coffee grow light with the swirling cream. Then she sliced off a thick chunk of raisin cinnamon bread, which she toasted and buttered. Its sweet aroma mingled temptingly with the scent of the coffee. Her goal for this weekend was to unplug and get back in touch with herself and the world, to rebuild her capacity to feel centered and to enjoy each moment as she lived it. And so, Maya focused on each of her actions rediscovering the satisfaction of doing one thing at a time and giving it her full attention. She reveled in the simplicity of making good food and appreciating it. She ate her breakfast in front of the cottage window where she could face out across the country road to an open field and the ocean beyond. The sky was wide open in her view, and she observed it at leisure while she ate. A handful of white clouds skittered across the sky, pushed by the morning breeze. Apart from those few clouds, the sky was a clear, light blue that seemed to invite adventure. After breakfast, Maya tidied up the kitchen and bedroom then showered quickly. She dressed in layers to suit a sunny but breezy day on the coast. Sturdy shoes, an old baseball cap, and her cozy coat completed her outfit. Once she was all ready, she grabbed a water bottle and a nature guide to the area, stuffing them into her backpack. Then she went outside. The morning air felt cool and fresh on her face as she stepped onto the path that led from the cottage door to the road out front. The road ran up and down the coastline. It had a smattering of houses along one side, while the other side 
was lined with open fields. Just across the fields were bluffs that overlooked the Pacific. This was the route Maya took now, cutting across the road and through the fields towards the ocean. She saw artichokes growing on thick stalks in the next field over, but this one seemed to be, as yet, unplanted. She tramped through the field and came out by the craggy bluffs. The ocean lay below her, grey-blue and vast, stretching to the distant horizon. The sunshine glinted off the surface, twinkling in the clear morning. Waves splashed lazily over the rocky shoreline below, and seabirds swooped near the water, no doubt looking for their breakfast. The air felt salty and damp, fresh on her skin. The vegetation here, overlooking the ocean, was a tangle of stubby ice plant and low, native shrubs adapted to the salt and wind. A narrow path was worn into the vegetation. It ran along the bluffs, and she followed it now, heading northward. According to her map, there should be a way to get down to a little beach not far from here, and then there would be a seal colony some time after that. As she walked along the path, she enjoyed the feel of the packed dirt beneath her shoes. When was the last time She'd walked directly on the earth, she wondered, and not on pavement. Before long, she reached a place where the bluff dipped, and a canyon opened in front of her, with another path winding down a gentle slope. This side path led down to a small beach. She made her way to the beach and stepped onto firm, dark sand. It was still slightly damp from the high tide. Her shoes made crisp prints in the moist sand. She crunched along to a drier section of the beach, where the tide didn't reach. Her shoes sunk deeper into the softer, dry sand. Here, she saw piles of pebbles and shells. She bent over to investigate and discovered that the beach was littered with pieces of abalone shell. These beautiful shells aren't much different from clam shells on the outside. But on the inside, they shimmer with a swirling, iridescent rainbow of greens and blues and purples and silvers. The shells are large when they're intact, but Maya didn't see any full shells around. 
Instead, she saw dozens or hundreds of pieces of shell, shining with rainbow swells, worn smooth around the edges by the waves. There were pieces as big as silver dollars, and tiny pieces that shone like pearls, and all the sizes in between. She gazed in fascination, picking up some of the most beautiful and running her fingers over the silky smooth bits of shell. After picking up and dropping a dozen or more pieces, all of them stunningly lovely, she selected a favorite and tucked it into her pocket. Then she meandered close to the water and looked at the waves washing over the sand. A wave would run up over the beach in a froth of white foam, then rush back out just as quickly, leaving a sheen of wetness that disappeared in an instant. There would be a glimpse of the patch of damp sand before it was washed over once again by another foaming wave. The pattern was so simple and repetitive, yet at the same time, each wave was unique. Each line of foam came up a little further, or a little less far than the one before and the pattern of damp sand it left behind had a different contour each time. And somehow, these tiny changes were mesmerizing as she watched the ancient and ethereal ebb and flow of the water against the earth the same pounding of wave after wave, day and night, year after year, had ground stone into sand, the very sand that formed this beach. Maya inhaled and felt the dampness of the ocean spray in the air. Then she turned and headed north along the edge of the water. She saw a rocky patch of land up ahead, and she suspected there would be some tide pools there for her to explore. Sure enough, she soon spotted round pools of water glistening atop the wide, flat rocks. She stepped gingerly onto the rocky ground, paying attention to where she laid her feet in order to avoid slipping or crushing any seashells. Approaching one of the pools, she leaned closer to peer into it. The water was perfectly still and clear, allowing her to see the world below the surface just as well as she could see above it. That tiny world of the tide pool was colorful and diverse. A large sea anemone 
swayed just below the surface, such a bright pink as to be almost neon. Nearby it was an urchin, round, spiky, and a deep purple color. A sunset orange sea star nestled on the other side of the pool, and a tiny greenish crab skittered along the bottom. As Maya watched and observed, she saw a shadow flit across the surface of the water, and looked up to see a seagull swooping to perch a little way ahead. A burst of wind gusted across the rocks, sending a line of ripples rushing over the tide pool like a set of tiny waves. She straightened up and looked around. She wanted to reach the seal colony, if she could, before leaving the beach in search of her lunch. She knew the seal beach was a bit further on, so now Maya walked with more intention, rather than wandering from sight to sight. She enjoyed the feel of the walk itself now, stretching her limbs, her feet pounding the damp ground, the air stirring softly around her as she moved forward with purpose. Her mind wandered pleasantly and aimlessly as she focused her attention on the movement of her body. She was immersed in her senses, the feel of her own movement, the brisk air, and the warming sun, the sound of the waves and the birds, the smell and taste of the sea salt in the fresh air, and the sights all around her of this bright morning at the edge of the great Pacific Ocean. And then, another sound drew her attention to a stretch of beach just coming into view around an outcropping of rock. She heard something moving across the sand, and she realized she was reaching the seal colony. She slowed her stride and moved more softly. She didn't want to disturb the animals. Looking around in a partially protected cove, she saw an enchanting sight. Dozens of seals lay on the beach, while others dragged themselves determinedly across the sand. Babies lie next to their mothers, and groups of larger seals piled together, soaking up the sunshine. Looking towards the water, she saw more seals of all sizes dipping and diving through the grey-green waves. Their nimble movements looked like so much fun that she felt a momentary urge to join them in a swim, even though she knew the ocean waters would feel icy cold 
to her fur-free skin. So instead, she found a dry rock with a smooth, gently curved surface. She sat down, and the rock was surprisingly comfortable. It was firm and cool, but contoured softly from years of waves and weather. This was the perfect perch for her to watch the seals. She observed the varied colors and markings of their fur, noticing that each seal was a little different from its fellows, unique in its own beautiful way. Most of all, she observed their behavior. The way the dozing ones roused themselves now and then to scratch an itch, nudge one of their neighbors, or suddenly flop down towards the water. The way the seals lumbered with effort over the sand, but swam with such incredible grace. And the way the swimming seals looked like dancers or acrobats, flipping and turning through the water with the greatest of ease. After a time, she saw one of the seals come up with a fish, and that prompted her to notice that she too was beginning to feel ready for lunch. She rose slowly from the rock, reminding herself of a dozing seal bestirring itself to flop towards the sea, and she turned to head back down the beach the way she'd come. There was a staircase built into the sandy cliff just before the seal colony, where she could climb up to the bluffs overlooking the ocean. Nearby was the market, where she'd bought her groceries for this weekend, and near that market, she knew there was a little cafe. That was where she would have lunch, she planned. The cafe had been closed last night when she picked up her groceries, but she'd checked its hours and remembered that it should be open now. So she found the staircase and climbed the few but steep stairs. They were simple wooden steps embedded into the sloping cliffside. Little plants and flowers sprouted around the weather-worn timber. At the top, she looked around to take in her bearings and spotted the food market. And as expected, there was the cafe not far beyond. A mural of a seascape was painted in vibrant colors on the exterior of the cafe, and a handful of tables were set out in front, marking it open for business. Before she headed in the direction of the cafe, though, Maya turned and looked back to where she'd been. This was another of her goals for this weekend. 
in addition to staying present to the moment, building her attention and focusing on her senses. She wanted to build the habit of taking pauses, to appreciate what she did and where she'd been, rather than always rushing blindly forward. So, she looked back over the bluffs onto the beach below, and she was rewarded with a panoramic view of the seal's cove against the backdrop of the expansive sea. The coastline curved away on both sides. It was a charming tableau and she gazed on it, letting the sparkling picture settle into her memory. Then she turned again towards the picturesque cafe and the promise of lunch. She felt pleasantly hungry now, and she knew she would enjoy her food. When she arrived at the building, a young woman came out of the open door and greeted Maya, inviting her to be seated at a table of her choice. Maya selected the closest table which was covered with a colorful cloth depicting local sea life. She accepted a menu and reviewed the options. She was hungry from the morning's exercise, so she opted for a hearty lunch of fish and chips made with locally caught fish, of course. She added a freshly squeezed orange juice to the order, too. Maya enjoyed resting her legs, feeling the sun on her skin, and taking in the views as she waited for her food. In what felt like a short time, the young woman was back, carrying a plate with fish and chips steaming on top. It smelt delicious, and Maya was full of anticipation as she thanked the waitress warmly. She picked up a piece of lemon to squeeze over the fish. Then, she lifted a morsel, blew on it to dissipate the heat, and gingerly took a bite. It was tender inside a perfectly crispy exterior, and every bit as delicious as it smelled. She closed her eyes for a second to savor the taste, then opened to them again and looked around at the scenery. This was a simple, lovely spot, the view sparse but magnificent. The fields across the road were ragged and half-wild looking, and the bluffs beyond sported a covering of low vegetation, adapted to the coastal wind. She couldn't see the beach below them, but she could see the ocean stretching out beyond, whipped into white caps here and there below the white gold sun. The sky was a bleached-out blue that spoke of fresh air and sea winds. 
seabirds moved across it in the distance, like tiny ships sailing the air currents. She had been away from home less than 24 hours, but already Maya could feel that her experiment was a success. She was feeling at peace, in a way she hadn't for quite some time. An ever-present tension, which she hadn't even realized she carried, seemed to have seeped out of her body. Tomorrow afternoon, she would return to her regular life, and she would enjoy it. However, she would be careful to retain some of the intention and mindfulness she was cultivating during this getaway. Of course, she wouldn't always be calm and mindful, she knew. She wouldn't always be perfectly peaceful, or perfectly anything for that matter. And that was all right. But she would continue to return to this mental place of intention. And she knew that whenever she needed to, she could correct her course by granting herself another period of unplugging, another reset. She knew that she carried this peace within her, and she had the knowledge and the means to bring it to the surface when she needed it most, by taking intentional action to rediscover it. And because this feeling was within her, nothing in the outer world could ever truly take it away. She smiled, breathed in deeply, and welcomed tomorrow, even as she savoured today. She would enjoy the rest of her time here, on the beautiful California coast, secure in the knowledge that she could always find peace and contentment whenever she needed it. The drive leading towards Alana's destination was smooth and enjoyable. It reminded her of how fun she had found driving when she first started. The country roads she had driven through today had been newly laid and passed through beautiful scenery. Alana loved the Welsh countryside with its rugged nature. There were mountains and valleys, heavenly beaches, and dramatic landscapes. This was her favorite place to visit, to get away from it all. As she rounded another bend, 
Alana glanced at the rearview mirror. She was checking on Jack and Harry, her two golden retrievers. They sat on the back seats, each with their head out of their respective window, fur fluttering and tongues flapping in the breeze. Alana grinned. If the satnav was correct, they were minutes away from the cottage she had booked for the next five days. She turned off the winding road and onto a dirt track. The car shook and bounced, so she lifted her foot from the accelerator and slowed down. Jack and Harry were panting with excitement. They always seemed to know when it was almost time to get out. Both dogs stood up, sniffing the air furiously. They were impatient to explore. Driving on slowly, Alana soon caught sight of the farm, and then the farmhouse. She stopped the car and checked the instructions she had received from her hosts, who were the owners of the cottage. They lived in the farmhouse. As Alana double-checked the names of her hosts, a woman in a barber coat and Wellington boots walked out to greet her. Alana opened the car door, and Jack and Harry started whining, both their heads appearing out of the same window. Jill? Alana asked. Jill nodded and welcomed Alana to the farm. She spoke with a gentle voice and strong Welsh accent. The dogs were whimpering for attention, which Jill happily lavished on them. She stroked both their heads, which were poking out of the car window. Jill told Alana that the cottage was just a little further down the dirt road, and round a bend to the left. The door was unlocked and the keys were in a bowl on the dining table. She'd stocked up the firewood and put the heating on, ready for Alana's arrival. There was fresh milk in the refrigerator, as well as some eggs. And if there was anything else Alana needed, Jill had left her phone number on a piece of paper attached to the fridge with a magnet. Alana thanked Jill and got back in the car. She couldn't wait to see the place she and the dogs would be calling home for the next several days. Driving slowly, she followed the lane as it curved to the left. Then she parked on the gravel driveway next to the stone cottage. The house had two floors and was made of white stone. It was pretty as a picture. Though there was visible frost on the front lawn, on the ledge of each window were boxes which still bloomed with pink and orange flowers. Alana got out of the car, her feet crunching over the stony ground, and opened the back door. Jack and Harry jumped out, 
and immediately began to explore their new surroundings. After taking in the scenery for a moment, Alana decided to carry her bags into the cottage while letting the dogs run around. She opened up the boot and took out her bag. It was pretty big, and it was full of jumpers and warm clothes. On the way, she had done some food shopping, so she took those bags out too. Alana carried everything to the front door and let herself in. It was lovely and warm inside, The cottage had an open-plan living space, with the kitchen at the front of the house and a lounge towards the back. Alana put the food bags down on the counter and her big bag on the floor. She saw the cottage keys on the dining table and Jill's phone number on the fridge just like she'd said. There was a basket full of eggs, and in the fridge, two jugs full of fresh milk. Alana looked out the window above the sink. She could see Jack and Harry playing and leaping about on the grass. Such happy dogs, thought Alana. She enjoyed packing away all the food shopping in the clean and neat kitchen. There was a place for everything, and as she moved around the room, she thought about the meals she was looking forward to cooking. Afterwards, Alana decided to explore the cottage. She took off her shoes, leaving them by the front door. The lounge had big, comfortable sofas, a chestnut coffee table, a huge, cushiony dog bed, and best of all, a wood-burning stove. Beside it was a basket full of wood. On the coffee table was a welcome pack, explaining everything one might need to know about the cottage, like how to adjust the heating and the water temperature, and instructions for all the appliances. There was a note attached from Jill and her husband Mike, addressed to Alana and the two dogs, wishing them all a pleasant stay. Another booklet on the table was a walking guide. The cottage backed onto a forest that had plenty of walking trails, and a lake in the middle of it. To the front of the cottage, there were many more routes to take, through fields and valleys, heading towards the sea. There were sunrise and sunset times written on the back of the booklet. Alana checked the time. The sun would begin to set in about two hours. The last booklet had menus for local restaurants that would deliver to the cottage. One in particular caught Alana's eye. It was a menu for an Indian restaurant and had pictures of some of their dishes on the front. 
the food looked absolutely delicious and perfect for a cold day like today. Although she had brought food with her and planned to cook, Alana was quite tired from the long drive, and she hadn't yet taken the dogs for a walk. She decided to pre-order dinner and have it delivered for when she returned from the walk. After placing her order, she took her bag upstairs to the bedroom. There was a huge, cozy bed in the middle, and a big wooden wardrobe. Across the floorboards was a sheepskin rug. There were small windows on either side of the bed that looked out onto the front lawn and above the bed was a large skylight. Alana sat on the edge of the bed for a moment, enjoying the peacefulness. She could hear birds from the trees behind the house, the occasional mooing of cows on the farm and the sound of trickling water coming from a stream somewhere. And that was it. No traffic, sirens, or electrical buzzing. It was blissful. She looked forward to climbing into the soft bed and resting her head on the pillows tonight. Alana unpacked her bag, hanging some things in the wardrobe, and folding up her other clothes, which she put in the small drawers by the bed. Taking out her wash bag, she put it on a shelf in the ensuite bathroom. Then she headed back downstairs and picked up the keys from the dining table. She put her shoes back on and opened the front door. Locking it behind her, she went to join Jack and Harry on the grass. Alana was curious about the sound of the water she had heard earlier. Where was it coming from? She soon found out. A stream ran across the end of the front garden. Alana stood watching it for a while. It was quite captivating, the way the water twinkled as it rushed over the stones in rivulets and round little bends. She wondered where it started and where it ended up. Maybe it ran all the way through the countryside and down into the sea a few miles away. Turning around, she looked at the trees of the forest that towered up above the cottage roof. Out loud, Alana asked the dogs which walking route they should take. Towards the beach, or into the woods. A chilly breeze whipped past, and Alana pulled her coat tightly around herself. She decided on the forest route. The wind wouldn't be as strong in there, she thought. Alana walked around the side of the cottage. Jack and Harry 
excitedly bounding off her head as usual. She wondered how many new and exciting smells they were picking up on. Out here in the middle of the countryside, the dogs didn't need harnesses or collars. They could be free. The lane soon turned into a narrower path and led into the trees. Alana was right. The wind was practically non-existent here, and they were sheltered by the great trunks of the trees. Dappled sunlight lay on the ground, streaming in between the pines. Leaves covered the path, and due to the dry weather, they provided a satisfying crunch with each step Alana took. Jack and Harry whipped on and off the path, exploring the forest. They would check back on Alana every now and then to make sure she was still in sight. It looked as if the dogs were grinning They made her chuckle every time one of their shaggy heads peeped out at her. She was sure they thought of themselves as her minders, rather than it being the other way around. Alana stopped for a moment to look up and take in how incredibly tall the trees of the forest were. They loomed up above her and looked as if they were touching the sky. They made her feel tiny. When she looked back down again, Jack and Harry were on the path, staring at Alana curiously. She smiled at them and then started running racing off down the path. The dogs jumped into action, bounding after her and barking with excitement. They just loved it when she played with them. The three of them ran in and out of the trees, doubling back and playfully jumping out at each other until they came to a clearing. Alana hadn't expected the lake to be quite so big. The blue water stretched out in front of her like a giant swimming pool. Alana and the dogs stood still The serene beauty of the place was awe-inspiring. The air felt crisp and clean, and Alana inhaled it gratefully. This was truly fresh air. Still panting slightly from playing with the dogs, she decided to find a place to sit. The path went all the way around the water, and she soon found a spot of moss-covered ground to sit on. Leaning back against the trunk of a tree, Alana stretched her legs out. Jack and Harry were busy letting their noses lead them around the place. Alana sat there, watching over the lake. The surface was as still as glass. 
on the other side, she spotted a heron standing on a rock. His long neck was stretched as he gazed into the depths, looking for his dinner. Birds fluttered overhead, returning to their nests for the evening. Then the surface of the lake rippled. Alana stood up and could just make out a school of fish beneath the surface. A moment later, she heard a loud croak. She tried to follow the noise. It must have been coming from a frog somewhere nearby. She stood on the rocks that bordered the water and tried to find the frog. He must have been too good at camouflaging himself, though. Each time she thought he must be close by, the croaking seemed to move. The sun was getting lower in the sky. Alana decided to keep walking around the lake. She could do a lap, then head back down the path they'd come up and return to the cottage before night fell. Jack and Harry followed, padding in and out of the cool water, but not getting fully submerged. They were both fantastic swimmers, but the water was far too cold for a proper swim. So they just splashed about, getting each other wet anyway, and Alana too. Luckily, she had a big, waterproof coat. As the three of them walked the perimeter of the lake, Alana hopped from stone to stone, taking care not to slip on the wet ones. She felt like a kid again, exploring and enjoying nature, unobserved and carefree. For a moment, she stood at the edge of the lake and closed her eyes, feeling the afternoon sun on her skin. She felt a soft breeze around the hood of her coat, and heard the same wind swishing through the leaves of the trees. The water in the lake gently rushed back and forth over the rocks at its edge, and there was a flutter here and there of birds' wings as they flew overhead, and the occasional call of an owl getting ready to begin its nightly hunt. She could hear so much more with her eyes shut, quiet noises she might have missed otherwise. There was a gentle rustling in the grass nearby, a mouse, or perhaps a squirrel. And of course, she could hear Jack and Harry panting. Alana opened her eyes. The air was so fresh, and this spot so beautiful, it was hard to leave but she reminded herself that she was here for the next five days and could return whenever she wished. With that in mind, she turned and found the path that led back to the cottage. 
As the three of them came out of the trees, Alana checked her watch. She had spent longer on the walk than she'd meant to. She remembered the takeaway she'd ordered from the Indian restaurant. Her stomach was rumbling, and the cold had finally reached inside her coat. Quickening her pace, she was soon nearing the cottage. By the time she reached it, the sun had set behind the trees, and it was dark. Alana found a bag waiting for her on the doorstep. Inside it was the food she had ordered. She smiled gratefully and picked it up, then let herself, Jack and Harry, inside. As she slipped off her shoes and wandered into the kitchen, she realized how warm her feet were. Underfloor heating. What a luxury, she thought. After placing the bag on the kitchen counter, Alana turned to see Jack and Harry waiting expectantly. Dog food and water bowls had been provided by the hosts. They really had thought of everything. Alana took out some cans of dog food from the cupboard pulled open the lids, and served up dinner for the boys. As they instantly began to wolf down their food, tails wagging, Alana filled the other bowls with water. While the dogs ate, she decided to start a fire in the wood-burning stove. Starting with smaller pieces of kindling and scraps of paper, she arranged the bits into a pyramid shape. Then she struck a match, which fizzled and crackled, before she placed it in the stove. The flames licked the paper's edges, curling them as they burnt, and then caught on to the small kindling pieces. Next, Alana placed some firewood in the stove. Just a little at first, so as not to suffocate the flame. As the wood caught alight, she added a few bigger pieces and closed the door of the stove. She could already feel the warmth emanating from it, out into the room. Then Alana washed her hands, and began unpacking the boxes from the delivery bag. The food inside was still piping hot. She found the crockery cupboard and moved the food into bowls. After getting herself a big plate, cutlery, and a tray, Alana carried everything over to the coffee table in front of the couch. As she settled on a big cushion on the floor in front of her food, Jack and Harry came over to join her. They instinctively knew the dog bed was for them. After sniffing at it and spinning round each other a few times, they flopped down together 
letting out contented sighs. What could be cozier, Alana thought. Hot dishes of delicious food, a warm cottage, and two sleepy golden retrievers curled up beside her. She smiled to herself. How lucky she was. Alana switched on the television and scrolled through the channels. A film had just started. As she watched, she began to eat. The food was delicious. A perfect blend of spices, different textures and flavors, all working in harmony with one another. When she'd finished her supper, she carried the tray back to the kitchen. As she washed up the dishes, she could hear the stream at the end of the garden. After placing the dishes on the drying rack, She then made sure the countertops were all clean, ready for the morning. The dogs were snoozing, but when Alana called their names, their ears instantly pricked up, and they were on their feet, ready to follow her to bed. Alana picked up the dog bed and carried it upstairs. In the bedroom, she placed their bed beside hers. Then she looked around. Where were Jack and Harry? She'd assumed they would follow her up here. Soft whining noises were coming from the hallway. Following the sound, Alana left the bedroom. And then she saw that Jack and Harry were waiting for her at the bottom of the stairs. Their paws were sliding on the wooden steps, and they were stuck waiting for Alana to come and help them. Their little faces looking up at her were so sweet. Alana's heart swelled with how much love she had for them. She chuckled as she descended. Helping Jack first, Alana encouraged him to take one step at a time. It was the slipperiness of their paws on the polished wood that was holding them back. She stood close behind Jack as he began to ascend, gently pushing his shaggy back and letting him know he wouldn't fall. Once he'd successfully made it to the top, he bounded into the bedroom. Alana retraced her steps to help Harry. She used the same technique, staying close behind him so he knew he was safe, even if he slipped around a little. They'd be used to the stairs in a day or so, she thought, and would no doubt soon be zooming up and down them. At last, with the boys curled up together on their bed, Alana climbed into hers. It was as soft 
and as plush as she had hoped. She sank into the mattress, pulling the crinkly duvet all the way to her chin. After leaning over to switch off the bedside lamp, she settled her head back on the pillow, and she noticed a light was still shining from somewhere. She looked up and saw a magnificent full moon glowing above her through the skylight. It was like a painting that had been framed and placed in the perfect position over the bed. As she gazed at the moon, Alana heard Jack and Harry's gentle snoring coming from where they slept below. She smiled content, and felt her eyes begin to get heavier and heavier, and soon Alana sank into a deep sleep. The first of May dawned bright and sunny, although there was still a spring chill in the air, the birds were up with the sun, singing in full force. A light breeze ruffled the tender green leaves that were beginning to fill in the tree branches. When Nora opened her eyes, she knew it was going to be a splendid day. The fine weather was especially important because Nora had been invited to a garden party. Most years, the first of May came and went without much fuss. However, her friend Laurie had turned 13 the previous week. She had the marvelous idea to celebrate her birthday with a May Day themed outdoor party in her garden. The invitation had stipulated festive spring attire, fairies welcome. This mysterious dress code was delightfully nonspecific. It had given Nora the perfect excuse to wear her prettiest new dress, and she was planning to top it off with a delicate crown of flowers. The garden party was at lunchtime. Nora was impatient for the morning hours to pass. When it was finally time to leave for the party, she checked her reflection in the full-length mirror in the hallway. Her dress was full-skirted and covered in a delicate floral print. To keep her warm enough in the spring weather, Her mother had insisted on a pale green cardigan. She turned in a circle and watched the skirt float around her. Then her mother handed her Laurie's sweetly wrapped birthday gift. It was topped with a frothy pink bow. 
it was time to go. Nora's mother dropped her off at Laurie's front door with a wave, promising to pick her up later in the afternoon. Standing at the end of the path to Laurie's house, Nora admired the beautifully decorated front door, which was decked with boughs of yellow flowers. She approached the house, rang the doorbell, and stood expectantly on the doorstep. Laurie opened the door and beamed at Nora. The birthday girl was dressed from head to toe like a magical sprite. Her dress was almost like a ballerina costume, sky blue with a fluffy tulle skirt. Her hair was styled with elaborate braids and piled on her head, decorated with a sparkly little crown. She clapped delightedly at the sight of her friend, and then turned to show her costume from the back, where two gauze wings hung from her shoulders. She was all ready to be the fairy queen of her birthday party. Taking Nora's hand, Laurie pulled her excitedly through the house, stopping to show her where to leave her gift. When they emerged in the backyard, Nora was open-mouthed at the beautiful scene. They walked through a gorgeously decorated floral bower, and she found herself standing in front of a tent that sheltered a lavish buffet. Tiny tea sandwiches were neatly arranged on large platters. Carafes of sparkling juices glowed ruby red and lemony yellow in the sunlight. Laurie's mother had also put out her fine china for the occasion. It was carefully stacked at the end of the table with its traditional blue pattern. Little silver forks and spoons were arranged nearby. Best of all, instead of a single cake, there was a tower of elegant pastries. Nora could see small cupcakes, delicate pastel cookies, and adorable tarts in frilly paper cups. Despite her punctuality, Nora was not the very first person to arrive. A few other friends from school were milling about the yard in various interpretations of party dress, chatting and eyeing the lunch table. But very best of all, right in the middle of the garden, there was a tall maypole. A floral arrangement adorned to the top and it had long, silky ribbons hanging from it in a riot of colors. Pink, yellow, blue, green, and white. Nora had never actually danced around a maypole, and she was curious to find out how it worked. The luncheon buffet was soon being served. Time passed quickly and pleasantly at the party. Gifts were opened, and 
before Nora knew it, Laurie's mother was gathering the guests around the maypole and explaining how the dance would work. Nora could tell that Laurie had practiced beforehand. Queen of the proceedings, she stood confidently, holding a bright pink ribbon in her hand. With her mother's help, she demonstrated how half of the guests would go in each direction around the pole, weaving in and out. If they did their dance correctly, the pole would be braided in a consistent pattern by the time they ran out of ribbon. All the children stood around expectantly, making humorous faces at each other. When the music started, Nora began moving in the direction assigned to her. There was some confusion as a few guests got off on the wrong foot, but they were soon laughing with delight as they correctly navigated the dance, slowly braiding their silken ribbons around the pole. As Nora became more confident, she skipped more exuberantly, letting the ribbon fly up and down as she went in and out. The breeze was cool on her warm face as she gathered speed and relaxed into the pattern. There was a lot of calling out as a child here or there made a mistake, but Nora was flying effortlessly through the moment, relishing the sunshine on her face and the music in the air. At that moment, something a little strange happened. The entire party scene faded away, and she felt like time stood still. The sunshine and the wind were still there, but she felt like she had gone somewhere, as if the earth had shifted smoothly under her feet and the scenery had changed. She stopped to get her bearings. When she lifted her head, she couldn't believe her eyes. Nora was no longer in Laurie's garden. Instead, she was standing in a bustling street. Everywhere she looked, there were people wearing colorful, draped robes. They were bartering, talking, laughing, and riding horses. Although she stood out among them in her frilly party dress, Nobody seemed to see her. It's very festive, isn't it? Said a female voice behind her. Nora turned to look at a statuesque woman with a crown of wildflowers on her head. She too was clad in the colorful draped fabric Nora had observed on everyone else. Unlike everyone else, however, she appeared to actually see Nora. Where am I? Nora asked in confusion. The woman gestured widely to the scene in front of them. Why, you are in Rome, of course. 
looking around again, Nora examined the style of the clothing and the classical architecture of the buildings. She realized it was as if she had stepped inside a picture in one of her history school books. Turning back to the woman, Nora had another question. And who are you? she asked. Smiling magnanimously, the mysterious lady said, Well, I'm Flora, of course, the goddess of flowers. Nora considered the festive wreath on her head and her elegant dress and nodded. This made perfect sense. The woman pointed to a small building not far away. It had a peaked triangular roof that was supported by several pillars in front of it. That's my temple over there. You are very fortunate to be in Rome during the festival of Floralia. Nora took all this information in and turned to watch a chariot drive by. The driver was finely attired and important looking, and the horse ran with an elegant gait. As the chariot disappeared into the crowd, leaving a cloud of dust, she asked, What's the festival for? Flora nodded, as if this were a very normal question. Well, it's a wonderful reason to give everyone several days of feasting and celebrations. It's especially in honor of a fertile year to come. Spring is, after all, when the new year of life begins. It's so much fun that it goes on for six days, and you've arrived in the middle of it. Nora looked around her, impressed. People of all walks of life appeared to be enjoying themselves immensely. Not far away, some sort of theatrical performance was happening on a large wooden stage. The players were gesturing dramatically and the onlookers were smiling. From the laughing of the crowd, it appeared to be a comedy. Flora pointed to a massive structure straight ahead, and said the center of the activity is the Circus Maximus. Nora looked more closely at the enormous building. It was oval in shape and appeared to be an open-air theater of some type. People were streaming in and out of the entrances in large numbers, as if some were leaving an event and others were arriving for the next one. Outside, under the stands, the ground level around the perimeter of the stadium was lined with columns. In the open arches of the columns, she could see lots of activity. It looked like perhaps there were shops there. There was so much going on 
that she hardly knew what to look at first. Just then, a cheer arose from inside the forum. Flora noticed Nora's look of surprise and explained. There are many different types of entertainments that take place inside the Circus Maximus during the days of Floralia. For example, right now they are having horse races. If you can imagine, up to 150,000 people can fit in there. Nora raised her eyebrows in disbelief. It was true, the stadium was much larger than any she had ever seen before. Is it just wealthy people? she asked. Flora shook her head and smiled. All are welcome at the festival of Floralia. Then she added, although it's true that not everyone gets to sit in the best seats. Nora nodded as if she understood. That didn't sound so different from what she'd experienced. When she had been to the theatre with her parents, they were often sitting very far in the back. The goddess started slowly walking, and Nora followed to hear what else she had to say. If you were to stay until night time, she told Nora, you would see many people going to banquets and theatrical shows. They light torches and celebrate all night. There are six entire days of games. One year, there was even a tightrope walking elephant. At this, Nora clapped a hand lightly over her mouth, amazed. the two of them stopped to watch a performance of mimes. A small crowd of people had gathered around them. These revelers were wearing humble clothing that looked more ordinary than the fine togas of some of the other people milling about. However, they didn't seem to feel out of place and were laughing and enjoying the show. While she stood there, some exuberant people danced by, throwing small beans at everyone. Flora put her hand up as if to ward off the rain of legumes. What is that for? Nora asked. Well, it's to symbolize fertility, of course, Flora responded, laughing. In order to encourage my blessing, there will be a bundle of wheat brought to my temple on May the 3rd. Then Flora added, somewhat conspiratorially, I would give them my blessing anyway but it's nice to be noticed. Nora chuckled at this. She had never imagined goddesses to be so approachable. Another cheer emanated from the Circus Maximus. Nora motioned to the busy scene, saying, And to think, all we do for the first of May is dance around a pole for one day. 
Flora smiled. You know, she said, there are actually some old-fashioned maypoles around here, too. Nora scanned the street. She didn't see any. Noticing her confusion, Flora added, they are more likely to be found out in the country. People sometimes take the leaves and branches off of a tree and decorate it with flowers and ivy. Flora gazed at the Circus Maximus as if reflecting upon its grand scale. Then she turned her head to Nora and said, I think you've seen enough of Floralia for one day. Most of the nighttime celebrations will be for the grown-ups. Shall I send you on your way? Nora was taken aback. Send me on my way? Where am I going? Flora looked at her kindly and put a hand on her shoulder. Then she said, You'll see. Close your eyes and don't open them until I say so. Within moments, the cheering, the clip-clop of horses' hooves, and the laughter of the clouds was receding. Nora obediently kept her eyes shut tightly, even as she felt the spring air blow colder around her. She was standing surrounded by silence when she felt the hand leave her shoulder and a gentle voice said, You can open your eyes now. The scenery around Nora had completely changed. It was very dark now, and she was standing on a hill, looking down upon a medieval city. Turning to look at her companion, she saw that the woman was no longer the goddess Flora. Instead, a nun was gazing upon her, smiling serenely. Nora asked the woman where they were. You are in Eichstätt in Bavaria she said calmly. Sensing Nora's confusion, she continued, I am Valperga. I am now considered to be a saint, but I was once an abbess in the 8th century. I studied medicine in England, where I was born and became a Christian missionary here in Germany. I developed the monastery here into a center for education and culture. Nora was impressed by this story. She regarded the soberly attired woman before her. But what did you do to become a saint? Valperga nodded as if she expected this question. A lot of people believe that I have healing powers. This made a lot of sense to Nora, but she still had questions. What does this have to do with May Day? Valperga shrugged. The date of my canonization as a saint 
happened to be May the 1st. People were already lighting bonfires the night before May 1st as a symbolic protection from witchcraft. Somehow, my identity became linked to the fires, and now there is a traditional belief that I can also ward off witchcraft. Now, Saint Valpurgis Night is celebrated in many countries on the evening of April the 30th, although the traditions vary. Nora rubbed her arms. She was feeling a bit chilly. It was as if Valperga could read her thoughts. She said, It's quite cool, and there's not much to see here at the moment, is there? Come with me. I'll show you where some of the festivities are underway. Obediently, Nora accepted her hand and followed her a few steps into the dark. They had walked only a short distance when they saw a blazing bonfire up ahead. There were people around the fire singing songs. The red and orange flames danced wildly, casting a flickering light on all the people standing around. Some children were holding green branches. Nora overheard one of them being praised by a parent, who said, That will be perfect to decorate the house. Nora turned to look at Valperga, who was smiling at the fellowship around the fire. This is one of the simpler traditions, she said. In later years, in other countries, the celebration becomes far more elaborate. This made Nora curious to hear more. She tilted her head inquisitively and waited for Valperga to continue. Finland is an excellent place to be for Valpurgis, she added. In fact, I hope it's not prideful for me to tell you that Valpurgis is one of the four most important festivals of the year there. Nora raised her eyebrows, impressed. The nun folded her hands into her robes and continued. The event begins with elaborate carnivals on the night of April the 30th. In the morning, fancy picnics are set up in public places, and the celebrations continue with lovely food and drinks. Groups of friends fill the public parks, laying grand picnics. Under the blossoming trees, they feast, often on white tablecloths and with candelabras and fine dinnerware. Then the nun said, rather sternly, Of course, I don't concern myself with these lavish things. But she added, Students are especially prone to take part in these festivities, 
and some of them do get up to mischievous hijinks in honor of the holiday. But it's all in good fun. Nora was delighted by the picture in her mind and was eager to hear more. Valpurga continued. In the Czech Republic, it is traditional to search for a blossoming cherry tree and to kiss a lady underneath it at midnight. Valpurga pretended not to be surprised that Nora was looking scandalized. She continued, I'm just telling you about the traditions. I didn't create them. Nora giggled. She liked this very candid nun. The two of them stood quietly for a moment, enjoying the crackling bonfire and the strains of the lovely choral singing from the crowd. The sparks rising into the darkness were mesmerizing, and Nora found herself sinking into a mild trance. Then, Valperga turned to Nora and said, Valpergis has a lot in common with the tradition of Beltane. Did you know that? Nora furrowed her brow and shook her head. She had not heard of this other holiday. The nun nodded, smiling, and placed her hand on Nora's shoulder, telling her to close her eyes, as Flora had done. Knowing what was coming next, Nora gladly complied, holding her breath a little with anticipation. As she did, the loud crackling of the bonfire faded. The singing voices of the revelers appeared to drop away one by one. Even with her eyes closed, she sensed the inky darkness around the bonfire lifting, as if the sky were lightening around her. The last thing she noticed was the sound of cows lowing nearby. Then she heard the bleating of a goat quite near to her, and, without thinking, she opened her eyes. Nora was surprised to find herself standing in a farmyard. The animal noise was coming from a white goat that was stood a few feet away. Behind her, she could see a simple stone building with a gabled, thatched roof. The windows and door were both decorated with yellow flowers. Nora noticed that the lowing of the cow was coming from inside the building. It occurred to her from her history lessons that this house might be a buyer, which meant the people and animals were under the same roof. Turning in a circle, Nora could see rolling green pastures in every direction, dotted with a few similar dwellings. 
Has the neighbor got smoke coming from his chimney yet? This strange question, in a dulcet tone, came from someone now standing in the door of the cottage. It was a girl about her age, dressed in a homespun skirt and blouse. Smiling as if it were not at all strange to find Nora on her land, she pointed at one of the nearby houses. There was a small curl of smoke emanating from its chimney. Mother is very superstitious, the girl said. At dawn during Beltane, she doesn't like to light our fire until the neighbor's fire has been lit first. Without waiting for Nora to react, the girl skipped towards her with some excitement. Of course, she continued, there will be lots of fires soon. Grand bonfires will be lit on the hillside so that the farmers can drive their cattle between them. It's meant to give them protection from misfortune as they head out to summer pasture, she explained. Undeterred by Nora's silence, she went on. And then everyone will douse all their household fires, of course and relight them from the Beltane bonfires. Winking, she added, one can never be too careful, right? Nora nodded emphatically. She certainly could not disagree with such a philosophy. The girl accepted this as sufficient, I'm Fiona, she offered matter-of-factly. Then she held out her hand, revealing three pieces of coal. Nodding to the side of the house, she said, I have to put these under the butter churn. It keeps the fairies from stealing our butter. Mother normally keeps the churn in the kitchen, but she was scrubbing it this morning. Then she motioned to the floral bow over the door frame. And that there should keep the fairy folk out of the milking pail as well. Normally, we send some milk over to our neighbor in the morning, but it's bad luck on Beltane. Lowering her voice, she added, You might find your cow's milk transferred to the neighbor's cow if you do. Nora followed Fiona to the newly scrubbed butter churn and watched her wedge the coal pieces underneath it. Having finished this task, Fiona peered at her own dirty hands and wrinkled her nose. I'm going to go and wipe these on the wet grass. I can't very well show up at the celebrations like this, can I? Laughing at her own joke, Fiona tripped across the farmyard to the nearby grass and began wiping her hands there. As Nora followed, Fiona looked over her shoulder and said, Did you get some of the dew this morning? Nora was perplexed. Dew? she asked questioningly. Fiona stood and put her freshly wiped hands on her hips and made a skeptical face. 
did you miss the chance to take some of the Beltane dew from the grass and put it on your face? Then, as if passing on a secret, she leaned in and lowered her voice, saying, all the girls know that it's likely to increase your beauty. If you want to catch anyone's eye at the feast, it can't hurt. Nora looked at the grass doubtfully. Then she peered down at her frilly party dress. She thought she would look quite out of place here at a Beltane feast. Just then, a woman called Fiona's name from inside the house. Fiona looked at the doorway, and as if a clock had struck the hour, she appeared to realize it was time to go. Nodding at Nora, as if it were the most expected thing in the world, Fiona said, Time to go then. You'll want to be off. If you'll close your eyes for a few moments, you'll find yourself where you need to be. Quite used to this routine by now, Nora did so without delay. Again, the early May breeze blew lightly around her. Just for a moment, she soaked up the smell of the fresh green grass and the straw scent of the farm. The goat bleated again somewhere nearby. Then she sensed that Fiona and her thatched buyer had disappeared. She waited patiently to find out where she would end up next. The first thing Nora noticed was the sound of cheerful fiddling. As she stood, Trying to keep her eyes closed for a few more seconds, she became aware of the low murmur of a crowd as well. She sensed she must be surrounded by a lot of people. Slowly opening her eyes, she saw that she was standing on a village green in the middle of a party. It still seemed like early morning, but festivities were in full swing, as if they'd been going on for hours. Looking around her, she saw revelers talking, laughing, and eating. Alan Mai is quite a scene, isn't it? said a woman's voice behind her. Turning around, Nora saw a very pretty, young looking lady. She had a beautiful wreath of dainty flowers on her head, and her hair was very long and lovely. As if noticing Nora's scrutiny of her headwear, the woman reached up and adjusted her crown. Yes, I'm the May Queen, she explained. It's quite an honor. Last night, as they do every year, two men dressed up to represent winter and summer They battled in a mock fight, and of course, Summer won. 
Lowering her voice and leaning in slightly, she said, He always does, naturally. Then the man representing summer chooses a May queen and a king, and I was the lucky one. Nora thought this was very modest, considering the great honor. She imagined it must have made her very proud to win over the many other ladies at the village green. Nora's conversation with the May Queen was interrupted by loud caroling nearby. A group of singers were serenading people at their doorsteps, many of which were decked with boughs of hawthorn. In each case, they were being warmly welcomed, and they were rewarded with food. Nora and the May Queen stood watching them. They had their own harpist walking around with them, and they were quite good. Nora's attention was drawn next to a group of people who had started a dance to the fiddler's music. They were moving in pairs, and the ladies had colorful ribbons in their hands. Forward and backward, in and out, and circling around their partners, the dancers gaily stepped to the music without making a mistake. Onlookers clapped in time and shouted out encouragement and jokes. The May Queen shook her head at the dancers with a sigh. I must admit, I'm rather tired. Everyone's been celebrating since the fires were lit last night. Most of them haven't been home to their beds. Nora thought for a moment that she could understand how they must be feeling. She was getting pretty tired after her long trip, visiting all these strange places. She had to admit, however, that Kalan Mai seemed to be an awful lot of fun. It was certainly more raucous than Laurie's garden party. As this thought crossed her mind, Nora realized that despite all these interesting celebrations, she might like to be back home. She turned to the May Queen and asked her if she might be able to help return her to her maypole in the garden. After all, these women of May Day all seemed somehow to be able to send her onward. Smiling sweetly, the May Queen nodded, then putting her hand on Nora's shoulder, she said, You've been to quite a lot of places for one May Day, haven't you? Nora nodded. She was glad the lady understood. All right then, the pretty Queen of May agreed. Just close your eyes, and I think I can help you land back where you started. As Nora followed her instructions, the lady added, Or, 
as you can see from your journey, your May Day garden party is less about the start and more about the destination, isn't it? Although she already felt the village green fading away, Nora realized that was true. She had discovered that her dance around the maypole was a tiny remnant of all the May Day traditions that had come before it. Then the spirited fiddler's music was gone, and she once again heard the tune that had been playing in Laurie's backyard. She felt her feet moving underneath her, and the ribbons moving over her, and Nora opened her eyes to discover that she had not missed a beat. She'd been around the world, sailed through time, and woven her ribbons exactly right, from Floralia to Kalan Mai, and back to the Maypole. That night, With the party long over, Nora sank gratefully into her soft and cozy bed at home. She couldn't remember when she'd been this tired. Her mother had left her window cracked just enough to let in the early May breezes but to keep out the late spring chill. Sighing deeply, Nora leaned her head back into her pillow and gazed at the floral wallpaper in her bedroom. She didn't normally think much about it, but now the sprigs of little buds that decorated her walls took on a new meaning. They made her think fondly of Flora and the May Queen. They brought to mind the doors of cottages, cheerfully defending their inhabitants from unruly fairies. They meant that winter had given way to summer, and that the cows would return to the abundance of the pastures. Rolling over, she pulled the covers up around her shoulders and closed her eyes. And, as she drifted off to sleep, she saw brightly colored ribbons weaving in and out, in and out. And she was faintly aware of the distant strains of a harp and a fiddle floating on the breeze.
you stand in front of a small yellow house surrounded by leafy plants. A narrow cobbled path leads to the wooden door. The warm sun shines down on you, glittering off of the flat leaves of the palm trees in the garden. The air is thick with the scent of fruit, plants and flowers. You let your feet sink into the soft grass as you take in the orange and pink flowers and inhale the floral and citrus fragrances. A smiling woman emerges from the yellow house. She wears flip-flops, shorts, and a long buttoned shirt. The woman introduces herself to you as Flory and explains that she'll be leading the cacao tour this afternoon. She waves you into the house, and you slip off your sandals. Inside, you notice the small bowls laid out on the square wooden table in the center of the room. They are filled with cacao beans and powder and squares of chocolate. The walls are lined with shelves of chocolate and herbal tea. And there's a small kitchen with a stove, which Flory tells you you'll be using later to roast cacao beans. Behind the table is a small, glass-panelled room with a stainless steel table and a large melting pot. You both sit down at the wooden table in the main room. Flory explains how her family has been farming cacao here for three generations. Cacao is an important and revered fruit to the indigenous people in this area. Historically, they even used the beans as currency, and people would participate in cacao ceremonies. Many still do. First, Flory passes you the bowl of cacao beans and you pick one up. It feels smooth in your hand and smells earthy. You take a bite and let the bitter yet satisfying taste fill your mouth. Next, you pick up a few of the ground nibs and run them between your fingers. You put them into your mouth and feel their graininess on your tongue. Finally, you pick up the soft piece of chocolate. You place it in your mouth before it melts in the heat of the air, and instead let it melt on your tongue. The rich and sweet flavor rushes from the tip of your tongue, fills your cheeks, and runs down the back of your throat. It's delicious. The pleasant taste of the chocolate and the excitement for learning how to make it fill you with a giddy energy. Flory tells you part of that chocolate can give you as much energy as coffee, except without the jitteriness. The energy from chocolate is both strong and calming, she says. Soon, 
you'll learn more about the health benefits of the plant. Standing from the table, Flory guides you outside to begin a tour of the grounds. You slide your feet back into your shoes and re-emerge into the warm air. Shades of green are dotted with yellow, orange, and pink plants. As you walk down a gentle slope next to the house, it seems like every inch of ground is covered by something edible. Flory pulls up a green plant to reveal a bulbous root. It looks almost like ginger, but when she cuts it open, it's bright orange. You take it from her and feel the rough skin on your palm. Rolling the root between your fingers, you bring it to your nose and inhale the spicy scent of turmeric. When you hand it back, you notice some of the orange color has run onto your hand. Next, you head over to a papaya tree. You feel the ground cushioning your feet as you walk. The light brown trunk leads up to fluttering leaves which are long and thin. The cluster of oval green papayas hugs the tree just under the canopy, like an extended umbrella. As you follow Flory across the garden, you spot a wide lemon tree, a passion fruit tree with plush fruit and a cluster of spiky aloe plants. You take a dirt path up a gentle slope. Here, there's a group of short trees with what looks like giant lemons and limes growing on them. Flory explains that this is the cacao tree and the oval yellow and green fruits are the cacao pods. She pulls one of the yellow pods off the tree and hands it to you. It feels heavy, and the skin is waxy and bumpy. Together, you collect a few more of the pods and carry them along the shaded dirt path back to the yellow house. Inside, the room is cool as the fan spins overhead. Now, it's time to start making the chocolate. Flory places the yellow and green pods on the counter and slices them open to reveal fleshy, white fruit. She instructs you to taste one of the beans, but not to bite into it. You place the white fruit in your mouth and feel it melting on your tongue. As you gently suck the sweet flesh off, you're careful not to break the bean underneath. The taste and texture remind you of a lychee fruit. When you remove the seed from your mouth, you are holding a cacao bean. You try a nibble of the raw bean 
but it's soft and bitter. It's nothing like the chocolate you are soon to make. You take one from a yellow pod this time, and notice the fruit tastes a little bit sweeter. The yellow color means the pod is riper. Flory tells you that these beans with the white flesh on them are left to ferment outside in the sun for a week. The beans absorb some of the sweetness of the fruit, which is what gives chocolate its flavor. Next, Flory brings out some cacao beans that have already been fermented, so you can continue the chocolate making process. She turns the switch to light up the gas stove and places a large frying pan on top. You pour the beans into the pan and begin dry roasting them. Aromas of chocolate float from the pan as the beans cook. You stir them round in the pan, listening to them gently clanging against the metal. After a few minutes, you take the beans off the heat and pour them onto a plate. You pick one up, feeling its warmth in your hands, and take a bite. The shell crunches between your teeth, and a warm cocoa taste fills your mouth. You slowly finish the bean, enjoying the contrast between this one and the bitter raw bean you tried earlier. Once you've finished taste testing, you roast another batch and pour them into a bigger bowl. Then, you and Flory walk past the glass room containing the melting pot and out the back door of the house onto the deck. Before you are two grinders, ready for your roasted beans. On the grass on the other side of the deck is a long table covered with trays. You go over to look and see that the trays are lined with flat banana leaves. Cacao beans lie on the leaves, fermenting. Back on the deck, you pour the beans into the grinder. Spinning the metal handle around and around, the machine grinds the beans into smaller pieces called cacao nibs. You watch these uneven chunks fall into the tray on the other side of the machine. Grinding the beans releases the smell of chocolate, bringing back memories of enjoying chocolatey snacks as a child. Picking up a handful of nibs, you take a deep inhale and then let them fall through your fingers. You pour the rest of the beans into the grinder and keep churning the wheel, enjoying the beautiful background of plants and trees as you work. When all the beans are ground, Flory shows you how to sift the nibs through your fingers. 
the light shells fly away with the wind, and the heavier ground cacao falls to the tray. You try it a few times, feeling the grounds falling through your fingers, and watching the shells float away and flutter to the ground. The earth around the grinding station is covered in cacao shells, filling the air with chocolatey aromas. You hear the gentle hooting of birds nearby and feel the light breeze on your face. Everything about the afternoon feels utterly delightful and you haven't even tried the chocolate yet. A bright scarlet macaw flies into the branches of a papaya tree in front of you. Watching it perch on the branch, you admire its wonderful colors and take a moment to listen to its song. Costa Rica is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. All of the fruit you've eaten and all the animals you've seen and heard show you how beautiful this country is. After the nibs are sifted and the shells have floated away, you pour the tray of nibs through the second grinder. This one will grind the beans even finer. Round and round you spin the lever, watching the nibs being ground to a powder. The scent of cocoa gets stronger with each turn you're reminded of the warming sips of hot cocoa during cold winter months. The breeze gently brushes against your skin as you work. An iguana lumbers through the yard, oblivious to the delicious work in progress. When all the nibs are ground, Flory brings you a glass of water. You take a sip of the cool drink and wipe the sweat off your brow. Making chocolate is tough, yet satisfying work. As you rest for a moment, you breathe in and notice how the chocolate aroma mingles with the floral scents of the garden. The mixture is utterly delightful. After finishing your water, you carry the tray back inside and enter the chocolate-making chamber. It's a small room and the most modern looking in the house. The temperature is cool, and the glass windows all around let you look both outside to the garden and inside to the kitchen, where you'll soon be getting to taste your hard-earned treat. On the stainless steel counter is an open-topped metal blender. You pour the chocolate powder inside, and Flory turns it on. The grinds spin round and round, becoming finer and finer still. First, any remaining nibs turn into a powder, 
until it looks like the kind of stuff you could use to make hot chocolate. But then, to your surprise, the powder starts turning into liquid. Flory explains that the heat from blending lets the cacao butter in the beans come out. It turns the grinds into liquid chocolate. You watch the process mesmerized until the bowl is full of smooth chocolate. Flory hands you a wooden stick so you can taste test your creation. The mixture is thick and gooey, and the chocolate stays on your stick when you lift it out of the bowl. The blended cacao tastes rich and creamy. You can hardly believe no milk or sugar has yet been added to it. While you continue to taste test, Flory leaves the room and comes back carrying jars of colorful, dried fruits. One holds spiky green guanabana peels. Another contains the dried seeds of a passion fruit. A third jar holds the white flesh and red skin of a dragon fruit. And the last contains dried marañón. They're the tiny, reddish-orange fruits of the cashew tree, and they are loaded with vitamin C. You take a moment to consider each flavor before you decide which one you'd like to put into your chocolate. Taking in the bright colors, you pop open the lids and smell the different fruits. Sweet, citrusy, and a little sour. When you choose the passion fruit, Flory grinds the dried seeds into a powder. You pour the liquid chocolate straight onto the counter and watch as it expands from a drop to a bigger and bigger circle. Somehow, it stays perfectly round as you continue pouring the rest of the chocolate out. Flory sprinkles the passion fruit on top. The sweet smell of the fruit mixing with the strong cocoa lingers in the room. She hands you a short metal spatula, and you mix in the fruit with the chocolate. It feels soft and creamy as you stir it around. Once it's fully blended, you pour it into a heart-shaped ice cube tray. Flory puts the chocolate in the freezer. You lick the spatula, sampling the blended fruit and chocolate. The passion fruit, a little sweet and a little sour, mixes perfectly with the creamy and slightly bitter cacao. You bring the mixing bowl out to the main room and sit down at the wooden table. Flory joins you, and together you use sticks to scrape the sides of the bowl, eating all the delicious chocolate that was left behind. 
you're amazed at the unique yet scrumptious flavor of the cacao beans at every step of the process. You can really see why it was considered the food of the gods. And since it's such a revered treat, you don't want to let any of the chocolate in the bowl go to waste. Flory grins as she shares the snack with you and tells you about some of the health benefits of eating raw chocolate. It can give you energy and relieve stress. Some people even experience cardiovascular benefits from eating this rich treat. Flory also tells you that many of the plants she grows at the cacao farm are medicinal. They can aid in digestion, boost your immune system, and improve mental well-being. With the grin on your face from all the raw chocolate you've eaten, the benefits aren't hard to believe. You continue chatting as you wait for the chocolate to harden, and you become more aware of your surroundings, noticing how the wooden house seems to creak and whisper. In just a few short minutes, your chocolate is ready. Flory pops the heart-shaped cubes out of the ice tray and onto a plate. The chocolate feels cool and firm in your hand when you pick it up. But as it starts to melt on your fingers, you place it into your mouth. You let the chocolate sit on your tongue and slowly melt. It tastes even better in solid form. When you mention this to Flory, she tells you that mixing the liquid chocolate with milk makes for a wonderful hot cocoa. Taking slow bites, the flavor of the treat explodes in your mouth. The chocolate is slightly bitter, but also creamy, and the passion fruit adds the perfect amount of sweetness. It tastes even more delightful knowing that everything you needed to make this wonderful treat was grown right here. And being responsible for the creation of the chocolate yourself makes it all the more satisfying. While you eat, Flory puts on a pot of herbal tea. She tells you it's made from guanabana fruit grown on the property and is a powerful antioxidant. Before modern medicine, people used it to treat many illnesses, and it's still eaten or drunk today. The tea is smooth and bittersweet, the subtle flavor perfectly complementing the cacao. As you sip on the tea and finish the chocolate, you laugh and share stories with your knowledgeable guide. She tells you about growing up in the rainforests of Costa Rica and how she learned to make chocolate. 
you tell her stories of your life and about some of your favorite treats from back home. Outside, the sun is starting to set. When you take the last bite of chocolate on the plate, your mouth immediately turns into a smile at the soothing taste. You take your time eating it, letting it melt slightly on your tongue, before slowly chewing. The taste spreads from the tip of your tongue through your entire body. Everything about it is heavenly. With a smile on your face, you take the rest of your tea outside. The mug warms your hands as you step back into the soundscape of Costa Rica. Howler monkeys laugh somewhere in the distance, jumping from tree to tree, and brightly colored birds sing to you as the sun glitters on the leaves, each with their own shape. The warmth of the tea spreads through your body making you feel fully relaxed and at ease in this magical place. The setting sun paints everything in a rosy glow. The turmeric plants and the papaya and lemon trees You feel so grateful for being able to experience this place, and you're especially grateful for having tasted the chocolate. Letting everything wash over you, you begin to feel even more relaxed, like you're ready to crawl into bed and fall asleep in the midst of the Costa Rican rainforest. On this beautiful morning in early June, you've come to explore the countryside. This part of central Italy, not far from Rome, is full of natural beauty. It's a land of lush fields, hills, and volcanic lakes. And there's more to the countryside than meets the eye, as well as the many farms and vineyards, there are woods full of edible treasures, but you have to know where to look. As you walk through the field, you're accompanied by a local guide. Sonia is a cheerful, talkative woman in her sixties, who carries a large wicker basket over her arm. Like you, she's dressed in light, comfortable clothes and wearing sturdy shoes. Trotting beside Sonia is her black and white dog, a spaniel named Lola. 
together, the three of you walk slowly through the long grass, which is dotted with bright red poppies and other wildflowers. You can feel the sun gently warming the back of your neck, as well as a cool, pleasant breeze. It's going to be a hot day, but right now, mid-morning, the temperature is perfect. The gradual transition from spring to summer is such a lovely time of the year. The days become warmer, but they're still fresh, and the coming of the new season brings a subtle change in atmosphere, as well as the rich scents of new flowers in bloom. You can appreciate these changes in the city, too, but they seem even more special out here immersed in nature. It's so quiet and peaceful. This part of the countryside has remained almost untouched. There are no cars, buildings, or even other people. It's pure nature. The only sounds are the melodic bird song in the background. And, if you listen closely, the low buzz of insects. The sound of your footsteps is muffled by the soft earth and surrounding grass. It almost feels as though you're a silent, invisible presence, passing through without disturbing nature. You're happy to be here with Sonia, who knows the area well. She clearly has a deep respect for nature and a knowledge of many of the plants that grow here. During your walk, she often draws your attention to things you might have easily missed. She points out a particular butterfly, or a plant that can be identified by the distinctive shape of its leaves. Sonia explains that she has always been observant ever since she was a child. She enjoys looking closely at things and appreciating aspects of nature that others take for granted. Many of the plants you're going to see today are often called weeds. But as Sonia points out, there's nothing wrong with them. The term weed is used for plants that are unwanted, growing in the wrong place in the garden. Out here in the fields, there's no such thing as a weed. Besides, every plant has its uses. This is something that the people in the area have known for generations. There's a long history of foraging, picking wild plants, and using them for cooking or for medicine. It was often women who went out into the woods and fields. They would spend long days gathering plants such as chicory, asparagus, nettles, or mushrooms. The food they harvested 
would be sold to local restaurants or markets and used at home to prepare delicious, healthy meals. Sonia recalls family members coming home with bags overflowing with leaves. For them, foraging was work. But for Sonia, it's a passion. Now that she's retired, she enjoys roaming the countryside, looking for anything she can pick and cook. And every now and then, she does foraging tours with curious visitors. She loves sharing her knowledge, and she wants to make sure that this understanding and appreciation of local plants is passed on. It's like a local dialect, she says. Over time, Fewer and fewer people speak the language, and the shared knowledge is lost. It would be a shame if that were to happen with plants and flowers. It's much easier to learn how to forage than to pick up a new language. But even so, it's a little more complex than you might think. You have to know exactly what to look for, and where, and in which season. Some of the plants are hidden from view, surrounded by tall grass, or obscured by dense vegetation. And many of the plants look confusingly similar to one another. That's the case with the first plant you find in a shady, wooded area. Sonia points out two patches of leafy plants, which are almost hidden by the grass. To your eyes, the plants look identical. They have long, dark green leaves, and look like a cross between spinach and rocket, or arugula. Sonia picks some of the leaves to the right, and explains that this one is the edible plant. It's wild chicory, or chicoria in Italian. Soon it will flower, and it will be easier to recognize, as it has gorgeous, bright blue petals. But even now, without the flower, there are ways to identify chicory. One telltale sign is the shape of the leaves. They are pointed resembling serrated arrowheads. Another clue is the arrangement of the leaves near the soil in rosette formation. The chicory leaves spread out like a star. As you bend down to help Sonia pick the leaves, she tells you more about the plant. It has a strong, bitter taste, and is full of fiber and vitamins. In this part of Italy, chicory is often cooked, and then fried with oil, garlic, and chili. In the winter, another kind of chicory is used in a crisp, delicious salad known as punterele. The leaves are soaked in cold water, 
and then covered with a dressing made from oil, vinegar, garlic, and anchovies. It's an acquired taste, but in this region, it's a popular side dish that goes with just about everything. You ask Sonia what she plans to make with these particular leaves. With a laugh, she explains that these are just a souvenir from your walk. Like spinach, it takes huge quantities of chicory to make anything. Even so, it feels good to pick the leaves, feeling the slight rough texture between your fingers. You like knowing that this plant has so much potential, and that you're taking part in a kind of tradition. For centuries, people have been foraging for chicory in the countryside, just as you are now. Lola also shows an interest in the plants, sniffing everything enthusiastically. She can't help with this kind of foraging, but with her keen sense of smell, she could hunt for truffles. One day, she might be trained. But for now, Sonia is happy just to have her company as the dog bounds through the grass, tail wagging. A little further ahead, Sonia spots another plant. Growing in the shade of an oak tree are long, thin shoots of asparagus. These are easier to recognize, as they're so distinctive. They look like delicate green spears with feathery tips. You're surprised by just how long the stalks are. Some are more than a meter in length. When they sway in the breeze, they make you think of strands of kelp underwater. There are moments when this secluded grove reminds you of being in the sea. The vegetation and long grass are like plants on the seabed, and the sunlight that filters through the leaves above has a dreamy, underwater quality. The atmosphere is so tranquil that you find yourself moving slowly, picking the asparagus one strand at a time, then placing it in Sonia's basket. You take your time, trying to gather as much as possible. Unlike the chicory, Sonia plans to use the asparagus in her cooking. She'll use some of it for a creamy pasta dish with a dash of white wine and parmesan sprinkled on top. But her favorite way to cook asparagus is in a frittata, an egg dish similar to an omelet. It's so quick and easy to make, and it brings back happy memories of family meals and picnics. Her grandmother made the most delicious frittata Each slice was bursting with flavor, 
and Sonia found it hard to limit herself to just one piece. As Sonia talks, you find yourself getting hungry. Then, as if reading your mind, Sonia tells you that there's not long to go till lunch. Afterwards, she'll take you to her house, where you'll enjoy a traditional meal made from foraged ingredients. Walking a little further, you soon come across clusters of borage, also known as starflower. The first thing that catches your attention is the flower itself. The central part resembles a red starfish surrounded by vibrant lilac petals shaped like triangles. But the stem and leaves are also unusual, as they're covered in soft white bristles, almost like a layer of fur. Each flower seems to droop, bowing its head. While the asparagus shoots stood tall and proud, the borage looks shy by comparison. The flowers are so beautiful that you're almost reluctant to pick them. But Sonia encourages you to go ahead. At this time of year, they are everywhere and these ones will be put to good use. Sonia will give some of the leaves and flowers to her sister, who likes to make borage tea. It has an unusual taste, a little like cucumber. But her sister drinks it not for the flavor, but for its calming, healing properties. Borage has been used in drinks and medicines since ancient times. It's believed to have all kinds of health benefits, from soothing skin to brightening moods. Sonia is more interested in cooking. She wants to try making some fresh ravioli filled with cheese and borage leaves. The flowers are edible too, so she'll sprinkle a few on top as decoration. She likes the idea of making something that not only tastes good, but looks beautiful. After gathering some of the flowers and leaves, you walk on deeper into the woodland. Lola seems happy to lead the way, bounding ahead. The winding trail soon opens out into a sunny clearing, encircled by trees with little white flowers. Sonia is just as surprised and delighted as you are. She'd intended to take another path, and she'd completely forgotten about this part of the woods. Bending down to stroke Lola, she thanks her for being such a good guide. Lola has brought you to an area filled with elder trees. Each one 
blooms with clusters of tiny, cream-colored flowers. They resemble little white trees springing out of the green leaves. In the rays of the sun, some of the flowers almost seem to glow, a bright, radiant white. Sonia takes out a pair of pruning shears and cuts one of the little bunches of elderflower. Then she hands the flowers to you and asks what you think of the smell. Inhaling deeply, you notice a rich floral scent mixed with an almost citrusy aroma. It's the smell of summer. Sonia takes a sniff and agrees with you. When the elderflower smells like this, it means it's perfect for harvesting. As you take it in turns to cut the flowers, you ask Sonia what she intends to do with them. You imagine she'll make a syrup and use it as a cordial or cocktail, or perhaps a dessert. Sonia smiles. You'll find out later, she says. It will be a surprise. Once you've finished gathering the elderflower, you cross the clearing and follow another trail. Along the way, Sonia points out other plants and flowers, including some nettles which she says are edible. Nature has so much to give, she says, if you're patient and learn how to look. She could easily spend the entire day here, searching every bush and grove. But it's time to move on, as lunch awaits. And as much as you're enjoying the walk, you're looking forward to sitting down, resting, and of course, eating. When you come out of the woodland, you can hardly believe your eyes. In front of you, in the middle of the greenery, is a bright patch of blue. It's a lake. The still surface is like a mirror reflecting the sky and the glittering sunshine. You knew that there was a lake somewhere near here, but you weren't expecting it to appear out of nowhere, like something from a dream. The intense shimmer of the water gives it an unreal quality, like a vision. But as you walk towards it, meandering through the tall grass, it becomes clear that the lake is not just a figment of your imagination. It's really there, a vast, still pool, surrounded by trees and gently sloping hills. Sonia tells you that this is a volcanic lake. It was formed thousands of years ago, when a volcano collapsed during an eruption. Over time, 
it filled with water, forming a lake. Some volcanic lakes become tourist attractions and popular swimming spots. But this particular lake has remained virtually untouched. It feels like a wild, timeless place. At first, the lake seems to be just as silent as the woodland. The only sound is the quiet chirping of the birds. But as you walk through the field close to the lake, you hear a soft splashing sound. Then, passing through a thicket of trees, a fisherman comes into view. He's sitting comfortably in a chair, his fishing rod extending out into the lake. Although you can't see his face clearly from here, you can imagine his expression, a look of calm contentment. He's alone in this beautiful paradise, basking in the warmth of the sun and savoring the cool breeze from the lake. Sonia whispers to you. She thinks she recognizes the fisherman, but she doesn't want to disturb him. You walk on, leaving him to enjoy his quiet, tranquil morning by the lake. There's not much further to go now. Sonia leads you up a sloping path through another wooded area. Here, she points out some more edible plants. Some are eye-catching flowers, while others are ordinary-looking plants camouflaged in the grass. Sonia is amazingly observant able to pick out edible treasures even in the most unlikely of places. You notice everything with interest, but this time you don't stop to pick any plants. You're feeling a little tired and hungry, and you're keen to get to Sonia's house. She says it's close by, but it's hard to imagine anyone living in such a remote part of the countryside. There don't seem to be any roads nearby, and you haven't seen a single building or any people apart from the fishermen. You continue on, up a hill that gradually becomes steeper. When you reach the top, you take a bottle from your bag and drink some water. In this moment, it feels like there's nothing better in the world. Just a few refreshing sips are enough to fill you with a new energy. After a sigh of satisfaction, you tell Sonia that you are ready to walk on. But there's no need to walk any further. Just a few more steps bring you to a gate half hidden by the trees. Sonia unlocks it and welcomes you to her garden. 
coming out of the shade, you find yourself on a large stretch of grass, bordered by flower beds, bushes, and the occasional tree. The grass has been cut recently, and the garden is clearly looked after. But it also feels relaxed and natural, as though most things have been left to grow without interference. It's like a tamed wilderness. Sonia walks ahead and beckons you to join her. From the far edge of the garden, there's the most spectacular view. You can see the lake in its entirety, a smooth, glassy surface shaped like a perfect oval. It's surrounded on all sides by dense layers of greenery and small, softly rounded hills. This edge of the garden is lined with bushes of beautiful red flowers. They create a natural border for the lake view, framing it perfectly. You're tempted to take a photo, but you resist the urge just for a moment. You want to experience this moment through your own eyes first, appreciating every detail. Your gaze drifts from the serene waters of the lake to the distant hills. In some parts, they are dappled in darker patches of green as they're covered by the shadows of the clouds above. And then, you look up at the sky itself, a celestial shade of azure. Afterwards, somehow, you feel satiated. It's like the sensation you had earlier, drinking the water until your thirst was quenched. Experiencing this kind of natural beauty fulfills a need you didn't even know you had. Next, Sonia invites you to sit down at a picnic table in the shade. There's a wonderful view of the lake from here, too. It feels so good to finally sit down. As you make yourself comfortable on the bench and pour yourself a glass of water, Sonia tells you a little about the house. She doesn't live here, but it's shared by everyone in her family. They often use it for parties and family gatherings, or they take it in turns to stay here at the weekend, whenever they need some peace and quiet. Although the house isn't hers alone, Sonia is the person who uses it the most. She comes here all the time, sometimes joined by her husband and children, and always accompanied by Lola. As Lola is a young, energetic dog, it's good for her to have all this space where she can run around. 
But right now, after the long walk, Lola seems ready to rest as well. She sits patiently beside the table, looking expectantly at Sonia. It seems that Lola is also looking forward to the meal. You remain sitting here while Sonia moves between the garden and the house, often followed by Lola. Rather than cook from scratch, Sonia is serving some food she's prepared earlier. You offer to help her, but she shakes her head and tells you to relax. You are a guest, after all, and she enjoys being a host. It doesn't take long for Sonia to bring out all the food. But when she's done, every inch of space on the table is filled. The food is simple, but delicious. There are fresh salads dressed with flavorful olive oil and cooked chicory with garlic and chili. Of course, there's an asparagus frittata, which Sonia makes just like her grandmother used to. There are also some green olives a selection of local cheeses and honey, and slices of crusty bread. At one point, Sonia goes back into the kitchen. You continue eating, wondering what she could be doing in there. There are already so many wonderful dishes. You doubt there's any space left on the table or in your stomach. But then, Sonia returns with yet another plate and presents you with the final dish. It's a pile of crispy, honey-colored leaves as well as some strange formations that look like bouquets of little golden bubbles. Then you look closer and realize what they are. They are borage leaves and elderflowers, lightly fried in a crispy batter. You take one of the fried flowers, holding it at the tip of the stem, so your fingers don't get greasy. Then you take a bite, feeling the warm bubbles melt on your tongue. It's a subtle flavor, but absolutely delicious. The layer of batter is remarkably thin, creating a light, salty coating around the flowers. The leaves have the same delicate consistency. After this memorable meal, Sonia returns to the kitchen once more to make some coffee. She suggests you make yourself comfortable in the nearby lounger. It's been perfectly positioned so you can enjoy the view of the lake and feel the breeze. Sonia is right, you reflect, as you sink into the lounger. 
just like the meal, every aspect of the garden has been carefully considered to make the most of its natural qualities. There's nothing that could be improved. It's perfect exactly as it is. Sonia will soon come back with the coffee, but there are no other plans for the day. You can stay here as long as you like gazing at the lake and drifting into a state of deeper relaxation. It's been such a beautiful day, you think. And just moments later, you give in to the urge to close your eyes and rest. Sam and Alfie are twin brothers, but their personalities couldn't be more different. Sam is pensive and a daydreamer. He prefers the tranquil things in life. Alfie is spontaneous, energetic, always looking for the next adventure. Yet the brothers share a special passion Both Sam and Alfie have one favorite thing in the world, and that is camping. Once a year, every summer, they pack up their camping gear and head off into the woods in the old mountains near the house where they grew up. And it is that time of year again. Early in the morning, the brothers meet at the train station in town and rent a car. It has been years since they lived in these parts. Before heading out, they decide to have breakfast at the cafe where they used to come regularly when they were younger. The place hasn't changed. It still has the same squeaky red vinyl chairs, hissing coffee machine, and big delicious pies lined up on the counter proudly displayed on domed glass cake stands. This morning, they have three kinds of pies, cherry, peach, and summer wildberry. Sam and Alfie take their seats by the large window, watching the morning mists which have descended from the mountains, roll gently through town. The roads are empty, since most shops and businesses are still closed. Only the cafe is open, as it always is very early in the morning, to welcome visitors or to see off traveling locals. These days, Sam and Alfie are both visitors and locals in this town. In the distance, 
the mountains take on a dual blue tone, that of pale sapphire. But it's just a trick of the eye. Up there, the forests are verdant with wildflowers in every known color. And when the sun shines brightly, a million iridescent sparks fill the air. The coffee is particularly good this morning. Simple, hot, and fragrant. Sam takes his with a dash of cream, while Alfie prefers it black. Unlike the places in the city where the brothers now live, there are no endless options or questions one has to answer before getting coffee. Here, a cup of coffee is the most straightforward, unassuming thing in life. As it should be, they both agree, realizing that, after all, they have more things in common than they usually expect to find. After breakfast, the brothers drive towards the mountains as far as the road will take them. Then, they park the car at the bottom of the hill. From this point on, the only way is on foot. It's a sunny day, and the weather is perfect for a hike up to the lush forest above, where they hope to find a good spot to spend the weekend. The brothers look at each other and smile as they take their first steps along the narrow path, which has formed naturally over the years. Sam and Alfie know that for the next few days, it will be only them and the wild beauty of these untouched lands and boundless skies. It's a welcome change of pace from the usual busyness of life. In these parts, one of the most striking features is the changing face of their surroundings with each season. The path, which leads from the foot of the hill to the forest, is lined mostly with quaking aspen trees. In the summer, the lush greenness of those spindly trees is deep and rich with the gentle warmth of the season. But later in the year, as autumn approaches, the leaves of the quaking aspen turn such a scintillating yellow that one can hardly believe it's the same tree. It's not a sudden change, it happens by degrees as summer fades into autumn. For Sam, this is what he loves most about the area, how nature takes its time to change, and how the changes follow some invisible, mysterious logic governed by the Earth's movement and its proximity to the sun. Returning here each year for his annual camping trip with his brother doesn't only feel like returning to the place where they grew up. Being here also feels like returning to some original source of life 
where time stands still and a person is free to simply be part of nature. Alfie walks a little bit ahead of his brother along the trail. Noon is still a few hours away and he is hoping to reach the old creek by then. Once the sun is high in the sky, it will get quite warm and he won't be able to wait to get out of his dusty hiking clothes and cool himself off in the crystal clear waters of the creek. Perhaps he'll even do a little angling and see if the fish are biting today. His usual spot in the fork of the creek never disappoints. There, he has been known to catch some good, juicy rainbow trout and brook trout, even pike sometimes. Hopefully, Alfie thinks half aloud, that will take care of dinner for the evening. He thinks he can almost hear the rush of the water in the distance calling to them. The brothers high con, sometimes chatting, sometimes quietly walking, breathing in the fresh mountain air. A day like this is hard to beat when the sky is brilliantly blue, the air is sweet and warm, and the song of wild birds cascades from the treetops. Here and there, they see a starling, a meadow lark, or a song sparrow, flying among the wispy white clouds. The further they walk, the closer they feel to the mountains, the trees, and the animals that roam these hills and valleys. The creek is particularly clear today. Sometimes, if it rains upstream, the waters can turn a little muddy but now there isn't a cloud in the sky and the rushing stream sparkles in the noon summer sun, casting off bursts of golden sparks each time the water rolls over a rock or branch. All along the banks of the creek there are majestic river birches Over time, exposed to the winds and the stream below, the trees have gently dipped towards the water. The crowns of each row of trees on both banks almost touch midway across the creek, creating a leafy canopy, shielding it from the hot sun above. The light falls in gentle streaks through the branches and leaves of the river birch trees, creating a soft atmosphere in this otherwise untouched part of the world, where nature is still free to be wild. Sam and Alfie decide that this is the perfect place to set up their tent for the weekend. Last year, they chose a spot down in the valley, in the heart of a glade surrounded by wildflowers and sugar maple trees. There, 
they saw a white-tailed deer and her young, grazing near their tent. From here, they're more likely to spot the white-tailed deer coming to drink from the stream and cool off, or to see a busy beaver working on a dam. Whichever spot they choose in these woods, it always reveals a special part of nature and the natural order. As Alfie wades into the water to try his luck with the rainbow trout and pike, Sam watches in quiet wonder the visual harmony all around him. The trees, the creek, the tall grass, and the birds above all form a perfect picture even though each is part of a world of its own. When he was a little boy, his favorite thing was to lie in the grass and watch the clouds roll by, trying to decide what shape each looked like. Now, He lowers himself slowly onto the grass, which is a little wet and cool from the creek next to it, and looks up. The cool grass feels good against his hot skin after a long hike in the summer sun. Its fresh scent is reinvigorating, and its silky smoothness caresses the back of his neck and shoulders. Up in the sky, a few white clouds appear. Sam can see the shape of a horse, a volcano, a star, and even a cloud that looks like a buffalo, the kind that used to live in this area many years ago. It's the most pleasant feeling in the world, he thinks, to breathe in the mountain air, smell the freshness of summer grass, listen to the gentle babble of the creek, while watching soft, puffy clouds chase each other across a blue sky. Sam must have dozed off, because when he opens his eyes, he sees that Alfie has already lit a fire and is grilling the fish he's caught in the creek. He goes over to his brother, and Alfie hands him a plate. They eat well, enjoying the delicious, freshly caught fish, a hearty, homemade potato salad brought along by Sam, and good bread from the bakery in town. The ingredients of this meal are few and simple, but neither Sam nor Alfie feels like there is anything missing. After lunch, both brothers feel particularly good and are ready to explore their surroundings. They put out the fire safely get their backpacks, and head towards the forest. They do not know exactly what they might be looking for, but decide to hike a bit further up the mountain, where they've heard there are some old caves. 
a large plateau wraps around the mountainside. Sam and Alfie stand there, looking over the lush valley ahead, carpeted in the most beautiful shades of green. They can't see the creek from up here, but they can see all the way across the valley, where the other side of the mountain range appears as a misty blue against the electric blue of the horizon. Not many people know about this place, but it ought to be considered one of the wonders of the world, Alfie thinks to himself. Up a narrow road, there is what looks like the entrance to a cave. Sam motions to Alfie to follow. They enter carefully, but realize quickly that this cave is a thing of beauty and not a desolate place. Air, wind and water have, after thousands of years, eroded the outside of the cave walls and left it pockmarked with round holes which let in the sunlight. Shafts of bright white light shine into the cave from its sides and roof, creating an almost kaleidoscopic play of light and shadow all around them. Further inside the cave, they find a natural pool that glows turquoise in the daylight coming through the roof above. The water is crystalline, and the ripples of the surface reflect on the walls of the cave. White, wavering flickers of light dancing all around them. Sam follows the reflected ripples along the cave walls with his eyes. They lead his gaze to a wall on the far side of the cave, where the shafts of light can't quite reach. He walks over and is met with an amazing sight. Sam calls his brother to join him, who is still by the pool, refilling his water bottle with fresh water from the spring. Look, Sam says with wonder, pointing to the colorful wall in front of them. I've never seen anything quite like it. Alfie shares his brother's amazement. They are standing in front of what must be ancient cave art. The images on the rock face are a mix of pictographs, painted pictures in colors of brown, red, and rust, and petroglyphs, images carved into the surface of the cave wall. At first glance, Sam and Alfie can see certain images that are not difficult to identify. Elk, buffalo, birds, and spears. There are also different human forms painted and carved on the wall, but these are not as easy to interpret. Some could be scenes depicting hunting. Others could be depicting celebrations or other rituals, given the wide, 
dramatic arm gestures. But it's hard to tell, since the carvings and painted forms have blended over time into the cave's rocky surface. The brothers are standing in the same spot where, many, many years ago, men and women stood carving and drawing images on the inside of this beautiful cave. Perhaps they did so to share something with their contemporaries, or maybe to leave their art behind for people who would visit in the years to come. Standing in this spot, where past and present connect, makes both Sam and Alfie feel the full power and beauty of these mountains, these woods, and the surrounding valleys. For all the years they've been visiting these parts, the brothers have never before come across rock art. The images are breathtaking, they both think. There is a special beauty in stories being shared through time. Sam looks at his watch and realizes that evening is nearing. Even though the days are long in the summer and they have flashlights in their backpacks, he suggests that they start making their way down the mountain and back to their campsite. Alfie agrees. The sun is lower in the sky now and the air has grown cooler. Walking down the mountain path, there is a pleasant breeze, and it feels good on their faces, which are warm from a day spent outdoors. Alfie cannot wait to get back to the creek and wash his face in the clear water. And Sam too, is eager to dip his feet in the fresh, gushing stream and relax after a wonderful day of hiking and exploring these beautiful surroundings. When they finally get back to their camping spot, it is already dusk. The sky is a luscious, vibrant pink, and a flock of birds, no more than black silhouettes, races across the sky. Sam takes off his backpack and feels the relief of no longer carrying any extra weight. His shoulders relax his legs feel lighter, and he is immersed with that sensation of being happily tired after a day of exercise. Sam enjoys that sort of pleasant fatigue that feels like a reward. It was how he would feel on summer evenings as a boy, after spending the whole day climbing trees and building forts with his brother and their friends. As the light continues to wane, Alfie notices that a little swarm of fireflies has gathered, hovering over the creek. The forest and the mountains, he thinks to himself, 
are a place of constant action. There is always something going on. This place never sleeps, he thinks, as he wades into the creek and fills his palms with the clear water, now an inky blue in the evening light. He splashes his face with it, feeling how it not only washes the dust and sweat from his skin, but relieves him of any lingering tension. They've only spent a day up here, and already Alfie is feeling refreshed and renewed. He looks over at his brother Sam, who is working on starting the fire to make dinner. Alfie is ready to eat after a day of climbing, hiking, and exploring caves. Looking through the row of trees that line the opposite bank of the creek, Alfie can see flickers of deep blue among their branches, the evening sky along the horizon. He remembers a story somebody once told him in childhood. It was the story of a curious little wood mouse that lived in this forest. The wood mouse was adventurous and always looking for something new to discover and see. What he wanted to explore most of all was the other side of the mountain range, the ridge across the valley. Every time the wood mouse looked over there, he saw that the mountains were a splendid medley of blues. They seemed to be so much more enchanting than the greens and browns that surrounded him. He imagined that it must be so beautiful over there, across the valley, a whole world the same color as the sky. One day, the wood mouse decided to cross the valley and reach the other side. He made his way through the forest, down the mountainside, and headed towards the blue mountains on the horizon. Along the way, he managed to evade the hawks and eagles soaring overhead. And along the way, he made new friends, like a rabbit and a red squirrel. Crossing the valley was the most adventurous thing he'd ever done in his life. But as he approached the opposite side, he started to think about a world that was only different shades of blue, and wondered if that was where he wanted to live, because he had begun to miss his forest. The trees that he knew, the glades where he roamed, When he reached the mountain range, he was stunned to realize that up close, it was not all blue, but the same colors as his mountains back home. And when he turned back and looked towards home, he saw that now his mountain was a magical blue 
in the distance. The wood mouse realized that everything he had ever wanted had been there all along. But he was happy to have gone on an adventure and made new friends along the way. Thinking to himself now, Alfie realizes he has always felt like the curious wood mouse. He's always sought out new adventures around the world, and he has always been happy to return here, to come home. The true beauty of a night sky can only ever be seen out in nature, far from the cities and the city lights. As Sam and Alfie finish their dinner, the sun has set completely, and endless, sparkling stars cover the entire dome of the sky above. It almost feels like being in space, a childhood fantasy for both brothers. The brothers sit silently by the fire. It crackles and sparks, and flickering embers glow at the heart of it, casting shadows all around. The woods around them are quiet now, and the night air is a little chilly. It feels good to sit by the fire and its soft warmth. From one of the coolers, Alfie takes out the desserts. Slices of cherry, peach, and summer wildberry pie bought at the cafe earlier in the day. They divide the slices between them and serve them with hot cups of tea, which are brewed right there on the fire. The tartness of the cherries, the delicate sweetness of the peaches, and the zestiness of the berries taste like little bites of heaven. The brothers don't say much, but the contentment they both feel speaks for itself. Once the full moon is high in the sky, it is time for bed. The night is clear and the air is pleasant. Both Sam and Alfie take their sleeping bags out of the tent and decide to turn in right there, under the stars. The brothers take turns identifying the patterns in the sky, constellations they have looked at since they were little boys. Sometimes they even find new clusters of stars and clouds that take the shapes of familiar objects. They point these out to one another. That looks like an oak tree, and that like a cat. That one is reminiscent of those forts we used to build. And softly, gently, 
instead of counting sheep. They end up counting stars and their endless patterns until they fall asleep, dreaming of new adventures and what awaits them tomorrow up here on the old mountains.